Residents trapped, and on top of all of it, the region also hit with an earthquake. We're tracking it all. Then, medical mystery the remarkable story of a father and son both impacted by a rare disorder. Do you feel like your son saved your life? You know, he definitely did. How their years long search for answers led them to a life saving discovery. Plus, fuzzy feet. We're along for the ride in Australia, taking you inside the efforts to save koala bears. There he is up there. They're so cute, aren't they? Coming up, how locals are working to help grow the population and protect these cuddly creatures. And swift chaos. Taylor Swift hits the Jersey Shore for a star-studded wedding, and her fans go wild. Locals saying they need to calm down after the pop icon took over the town. We've got all the details coming up in Pop Start today, Monday, August 21st, 2023. Kicking off the week from Birmingham, Alabama. San Diego. Try. Sherman Oaks. And Houston. From Seattle. Celebrating my birthday. On a girl's trip from Racine, Wisconsin. It's Isla's first trip to New York. Happy retirement, Pop Pop. We, we love, love you, Jerry. Simpsonville, South Carolina. It's Rylan's birthday. I'm turning 10. Woo! We are back at uh, 813 with one family's medical mystery that's shining a light on a rare genetic disorder. NBC's Kaylee Hartung came in from Los Angeles. She joins mm -hmm. us now with that. So good to see you in person. Hey, hey, it's great to see you guys. So Marfan syndrome, something you may not have heard of, but it has stopped basketball players from heading to the NBA, and it led to the sudden death of an Olympic volleyball player in the 1980s. Doctors even suspect Abraham Lincoln had it, and yet many people aren't aware of Marfan syndrome. The Anderson family wasn't until they discovered it was silently impacting generations of their family. Mm. A rare genetic disorder that can impact the body in ways both visible and unseen. While about one in 5,000 people have the gene, which can be passed down to their children, many don't even know they carry it. And for some, it can be life-threatening. Try to swing it more flat. Carly Anderson remembers when she first noticed the early warning signs in her baby boy, Parker. So he was about six months old. We woke up in the middle of the night one night and he was struggling to breathe and his chest was like super caved in. From there, I mean, it's been his whole life. A years long search for answers led doctors to test for Marfan syndrome, a disorder that affects connective tissue and can damage the skeleton, eyes, blood vessels and heart. About three in four people with Marfan syndrome inherit it. He's very special to me. Many people with Marfan syndrome are tall and thin, with unusually long arms, legs, and fingers, like Parker's father, right. Evan. Ready? Yep. And while searching for answers about their son's condition, Parker's parents made a startling discovery. Despite living 30 years of his life with no noticeable symptoms of the disorder, both Parker and his father were positive for Marfan syndrome. How do you explain the feeling of that light bulb moment? Yeah, it's kind of surreal growing up. I was so healthy and then all of a sudden realized that, oh, I, I have major issues. Evan's long limbs were always an advantage on the basketball court, allowing him to play Division I college basketball at the University of Wisconsin. Now, he knew the dangerous condition impacting his son's body was also ravaging his, and his life was at risk. A CT scan showed that Marfan syndrome was weakening Evan's aorta, causing it to expand like a balloon. He needed surgery fast before a catastrophic outcome and possible death. Lucky for Evan, at the Rochester, Minnesota Mayo Clinic, just two hours from the family's home in rural Wisconsin, was Dr. Malik Shrestha, one of only a handful of surgeons in the world with extensive experience in the aortic root repair he needed. He was very lucky, I have to say, because a lot of these patients do not have any symptoms because the, the aorta starts getting bigger, but that doesn't cause any problems until it's burst, then it's too late. It wasn't until after the surgery that the Andersons understood how close they'd come I to just, losing Evan. He told us I probably had around two months left. To be two months away from losing you know, my best friend, it's crazy. An intervention that might never have happened, if not for Parker. Do you feel like your son saved your life? You know, he definitely did. 
As for Parker, doctors check his heart regularly, and so far, it looks just fine. But he's had to learn to live life at a slower pace. He did a basketball camp, he loved it. I'm oh, sorry, bud, you can't do that anymore. One of the biggest things that kind of hit me hard was the fact that I won't be able to teach him, coach him certain things through sports. I feel like I'll have to try to teach him through a different route. What fish do you catch on this one, buddy? Pass. Parker is taking on new hobbies, like fishing, with his dad and hero by his side. I'm seeing him smile and enjoy life, it definitely always touches my heart every time I see him have a good time. A father's heart now healthy and full with every day spent with his family. Now this surgery has a very high success rate. That is when the patient is operated on in time by one of the few doctors who can perform it. The Andersons stressed how lucky they were to live within two hours of one of those highly qualified mm -hmm. surgeons. Mm -hmm. The proximity guys, it might have made all the difference for them. Kelly, yeah. how, how did the doctors even know to test Evan when he didn't have any health problems? Yeah, so like I said, he'd lived so much yeah. of his life thinking he was healthy, but he did have these telltale signs mm -hmm. of the syndrome. You could see how tall he was there, yeah. that incredibly long arm span, and he also has super flexible joints. So as they were trying to get to the bottom of Parker's case, the doctors realized Evan has these symptoms. Wow. Now, insurance wouldn't cover Parker to be tested mm -hmm. for it initially, but because Evan could and then was positive, uh, it led to Parker being uh, tested. And now here he is at seven years old, able to move through the world more carefully, but Living with it. Yeah. Wow, and yeah. The timing was so right for that family yeah. in every way. Well, wow. Wow. Haley, thank God. you. Happy to have you thank sitting you here on the podcast. Appreciate us. it. Everybody here today. All right. Happy 10th birthday, right Aww. there. Oh my Mr. God. Double digits. Mr. Double Digits. Happy birthday. All right. We've got a real busy uh, and fun half hour ahead for our Today in the Wild series. Molly Hunter is going to take us to Australia where endangered koalas are getting a much needed helping hand. So cute. Plus, we are going to walk you through our Today bestsellers for August. Adriana Brock with beauty buys, customers love, and some great wardrobe staples, including the ultimate cardigan for the coastal grandma trend. Ooh. And you check this out. Grandma. Also ahead, Rosé all day. Anybody like Rosé? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Our <laughs> favorite one. <laughs> the Rosé crowd. Touch the nerve there. Rosé so on a Monday morning. Uh, our, our wine expert, Vanessa Price, is here. She's going to show us why the drink of the summer can still be great and enjoyed when the fall weather arrives, too. Don't worry, everybody. I love that. All right. And ahead on the third hour, a fun one for our series, Through Mom's Eyes. I got to catch up with Denise Jonas. She's the mother of the Jonas Brothers. She opened up about what it was like to watch them become super stars and the moment she and her husband knew her kids had serious talent. I'm really looking forward to that one. Mm -hmm. Me too. This morning we're focusing on koalas. 
And we got a little help from NBC's Molly Hunter. Molly? Hey guys, good morning. While we were down under, we could not miss the opportunity to meet this country's most famous ambassador. The sad part and the very scary part though is that it is becoming harder and harder to find koalas in the wild, but we went looking. Driving an hour outside of Sydney to Campbelltown, we link up with local activists and koala whispers, Pat and Barry Durham. We're so lucky. That morning, they got news of a sighting. By a residential driveway, high above in a eucalyptus tree, there he is. There he is up there. They're so cute, aren't they? They are cute. The iconic face of this country, snacking, scratching, but mostly snoozing as he does 20 hours a day. He appears healthy, and this in the wild is rare. Everyone knows koalas mean Australia, and the koalas are like the face of our forests. Now we, we may lose them from the wild this century. Dr. Stuart Blanche of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF Australia, was part of the team that got the Australian government to list koalas as an endangered species last year in several eastern states. Nationwide, the rough total estimate is half of what it was 20 years ago, 350,000 koalas. The fear is the rapid decline and the extinction in eastern parts of the country by 2050. These famed marsupials face an expanding urban population, habitat destruction, the highest rates of deforestation of any developed country, disease, and the threat of climate change, which Australia knows well. Uh, a bit like the bushfires in Maui at the moment, mm -hmm. just devastating. Mm -hmm. We go through those fires and they're getting worse and we lose thousands of koalas burned to death. And we, we got to globally work to stop climate change. Otherwise, we won't have koalas in the wild. Back in 2019, bushfires ripped through nearly 60 million acres of Australia, displacing or eliminating 3 billion animals. But one of the ways WWF Australia is working to grow the koala population now is with drones to seed koala food and shelter trees. Here outside of Brisbane, but a model for elsewhere. Come over here. And that morning outside of Sydney, remarkably, we spotted a second koala. Sure, you more? almost sound hopeful. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of hope. I have hope at times, but it's hard. Yeah. Maybe. We can hope. Maybe. They're pretty snoozy. At Sydney's Taronga Zoo, their 19 koalas are a priority, and they're breeding for what wildlife conservation officer Rachel Schildkraut calls an insurance population. Hi, Piali. <laughs> Hi, Piali. I'm Molly. One of the things I love about koalas is that they're kind of like a flagship species for a lot of other animals. Back in the wilds of the Sydney suburbs, Dr. Blanche says it's a clear choice. We can have coal or we can have koalas. We can't have both. That's the future. Pointing out the latest development plans threatening koalas, Pat and Barry are still fighting. How about you? Any hope? Any optimism? I mean, God, my goodness, you can't just give up, can you? I mean, they're cute. And our grandchildren are worth fighting for as well. And they deserve to see koalas. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Now, you just heard a lot of hope from people that care very deeply about these animals. But Dr. Blanche says it's not just about stronger legal protections, about better wildlife corridors, about more natural parks. All of that is needed. It is also about training average people, residents who live near koalas, about how to make sure that area stays safe for these beloved animals. Guys? Oh, so cute. Mm -hmm. It's good to see the efforts underway to save them, too. Indeed. I love the koala. Did you know that? I mean, they, you know, they're, they're sleeping like 19 hours a day. They're snoozing. Oh, really? If you, if you catch a koala awake, it's a feat. <laughs> it's a big day. lucky day. day. Exactly. Exactly. On Earth Odyssey with I, you know what? That's exactly what I saw. That's a great, great, great program. <laughs> I hear a lot about that program, Dylan. Right. From okay. Dylan. Coming up next, from fashion to beauty, Adriana Brock is here with some fan favorite picks on Amazon for this month. But first, this is today on NBC. From oh, Dylan. Dylan. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
We're back with today best sellers this morning everything our shop today team is loving this month we're talking about beauty and fashion by the way all these favorites under 35 bucks adriana brock is our shop today editorial director and always remember you can pick up any of these all you have to do is scan the qr code that we have in the center Hello, let's start Hi. beauty and let's start upgrade. We're kind of getting into fall. It's sort of time to make a change. It really is. Everyone's mm -hmm. going back to school. It's kind of time to get back into mm -hmm. the routine, back into the habits of mm -hmm. stuff. So let's start with your beauty routine, okay. upgrading some favorites. So this is a Shop Today reader favorite. It's a light up mirror. Yep. And this is great for any vanity, whether you wear makeup or not. This is a really great piece because it has the built in LED light. So mm -hmm. you get that extra light that you want for when you're doing your makeup or your hair. Mm -hmm. um, but it also has magnification. Too. Love it. So you get two, three, and a 10x mirror. Great for when you're tweezing your eyebrows or whatever, or some folks who, you know, maybe your eyesight isn't the best in the morning yeah. and you need a little Easy extra help. Yeah. This is really great and it folds up really nice. It also, most, yeah. you can work it tilts at all up the and angles. down. Because most bathrooms don't have great lighting, so it's kind of nice to it's, just throw this on a table or a really desk or is. something. It really is. You'll always get the perfect makeup. All right, let's get the perfect brushes. Yeah, so this set I'm really mm. obsessed with because it's a set of 18 brushes yep. for $11.99 right now. Yep. Super affordable and you get everything you need for your face. You can use it on powders, liquids, creams. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you're the type of person who's like low maintenance, you're like, I don't really need all these brushes, break them up and give them to a friend. By the way, I have to say, I'm sort of picky about how brushes feel on your skin. These are so butter soft. soft. They're so soft. What's the soft. price point on these? Um, it's $9.99 for the set of 18 brushes. So that's like less than a dollar a brush. All right, we've got to keep our brushes clean. Yes. Yeah, so according to the American uh, Academy of Dermatology, yep. you should be cleaning your brushes every seven to 10 days. Oh. So we know we don't all do Nobody that. Especially does when that. you have right. so many brushes to be right. up that set but this is a really easy way okay. to take all the work out of it because it's an electronic brush cleaner all right so, what so it's do you got do? this really cute silicone base okay. that's textured inside mm -hmm. so that's what's going to clean your brushes but then what's really great is all you have to do is push a single button you fill it up with water mm -hmm. put a couple drops of your cleanser in there mm -hmm. um and you hold it down and you can see. see here all the stuff coming out. This is an eyeshadow brush. Yep. And everything just comes out. You don't just even have to scrub. Along the bottom. It drags along. Mm -hmm. And then you just rinse it with some water. I like super, it. Super, super easy. And this one is under $20. Nice. Um, just leave them out to dry. Yeah, okay, exactly. Cool. It's so easy to use. You just All turn right. it off again with Let's the push of a button. Let's get some fashion. Okay, so fashion here. The this key, looks like you, by the way. This is like yeah, so my style. Yeah, this is so you. Um, I love a shirt dress, but yeah. the key to end of summer shopping is to find pieces that you know you're going to be able to wear, not just now, but through the fall. Okay. And this is a great example of that. This is a flowy dress with a, a loose billowy sleeve yeah, that's yeah. three quarters. Love so it. You can wear it now. You can wear it with sandals. And then in the fall, throw on some boots, layer it on with a jacket, and you're good to go. Good. And it's super affordable, under $35. Would you wear it with leggings? or? Yeah, you could wear yeah. it with leggings if you wanted to. Okay. But really easy dress, super simple, and a piece you'll have in your closet forever. I love these kinds of sweaters. I, know. I love these. You know the Coastal Grandma yes, trend? Yes, love. It's still going, and I love it. And mm. this is, again, another great summer to fall piece because mm -hmm. it's the crochet. Uh -huh. It's lightweight. You could wear it with anything. Right. Like you could pair it with a tank top and jeans right now, your bathing suit, mm. and then you're going to wear it in the fall when you're feeling cozy comfy. I love and this. again super affordable very lightweight and it comes in a bunch of different colors. Okay. Too. All right. Yeah. How are we wrapping? Okay. Mm. We have the last two pieces. So these are kind of basics that you need. The first one is the mock neck turtleneck top. So this is coming back in style. It's kind of a higher neckline mm -hmm. a little bit more polished than your average t-shirt. Same with this longer sleeve that hits at your elbow. Yep. This is the piece that you need. You know when you're ever like looking for something you're like I need a top but a t-shirt yes. won't come Cut it, yes, I need but I don't want a fancy more elevated. blouse. Yeah. This is like the yes, in between. Yes. So this is the perfect piece. Okay. And again, hold up, denim skirts are back. They are? They are back. And we're loving this one because it's got the pencil skirt look. I like So that. it's a little bit longer. Yes. You get more coverage. Yes. It's more flattering on different shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. And it's got a nice slit in the back so you still get the range of cool. motion that you need. Awesome. Really great staple pieces for your closet right now. And by, by the way, for you, you've never looked better. Something's oh, happening you. with you. We don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's all good. All right. Again, to purchase these items, scan our QR code or head to today.com slash shop. And we should mention that today does earn a commission from purchases through 
our links. Mr. Melvin. All right. Toda copy. It is Rosé all day with our friend Vanessa Price. She's got the perfect picks for what's left of summer and a few that you can enjoy in the fall as well. Looking forward to this segment. Me too. Uh, but first, this is Today on NBC. Welcome back. This morning on Today Food, we're talking rosé. Yes. Many consider it the drink of the summer. It's versatile enough that you can also enjoy it in the fall. Yeah, from darker hues to richer tastes, there are no limits when it comes to rosé. So grab your glass, get ready to sip, get ready to swirl and savor because our friend here and sommelier, Vanessa Price, is back to teach us all about seasonal rosés, yeah. huh? So it's a fall thing too? So rosé is really something that can carry us mm -hmm. from summer to fall mm -hmm. and be just as delightful because when you think about summer foods, you think about the fresh salads yeah. and the citrus and that sort of thing. But as we start to move into fall and there's more root yeah. vegetables and things get a little bit mm -hmm. heartier, if we stick with heartier styles of rosé, well, oh, we can make that transition. Why don't we start off with something that's got zero alcohol in it, but you yes. say it's still tasty. Still very lovely. tasty. So this is actually designed by House of Warris. Um, it it is traditionally a tea company that has now moved into this space. It's fermented from um, pomegranate juice. Mm -hmm. um, the alcohol is removed. There's uh, cinnamon, cardamom, ashwagandha, all sorts of neat things. Mm -hmm. But if you want to ha sort of have that celebratory uh, rosé sort of mm -hmm. sip feeling yeah. without the alcohol, that's okay. a great way to go. All right. And you mentioned this one is perhaps a good one to get us into the fall. This yes. is good in colder months. Yes, yes. So this is a really great value wine, in my opinion, Vina Zorzal. So this Ooh. is a Garnacha like Rosado. So it's going to be very juicy. Mm -hmm. um, almost like a little bit of like a Jolly Rancher. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's got that <laughs> it's got same that sort of like tang to it, which is amazing. Um, and then we also have, also in sort of like our budget friendly, this mm -hmm. is about retail, about 14. This is 18. Um, Chateau de Caria. So this is coming from Tavelle, which is a French rosé, but coming from a lesser known appellation. You can see from the color, the electric hue mm -hmm. might initially sort of throw you off, but mm -hmm. when you taste it, it's like, oh, good. yummy. So Grenache is the main grape. There's a couple of others mixed in with it. Um, but again, Again, very, very delightful. And again, this, this is $14. This is $18. Those, yes. are, those are good deals. Yes, yeah. very good deals. You love this winery. I do love Hirsch. You Hirsch's love fingers. this winery. I do. I do. So Jasmine Hirsch is a second generation winemaker. I just think she's an all around, like, uh, really awesome woman in the world of mm -hmm. wine. Um, uh, young, making her way through everything. This is actually their first vintage of a rosé program that they're doing. Um, it's got a little bit of, like, a, a bite to it, a little bit of a crunch mm. to it, which mm -hmm. makes it really great and food mm. friendly. It's Pinot? Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir. Huh. Yeah. Wow. From California. What would you yeah. serve that with? What meal would you serve that with? So any sort of, like, a roasted chicken, and if mm -hmm. you did, like, a very simple sort of um, roasted vegetable situation, maybe a little bit of a honey glaze on mm, it. A honey a glaze. Fun. I like yeah. the bottle on this one. Yeah, this is a fancy one. <laughs> yes. Now we're getting into a little bit of our splurge territory. Mm -hmm. So from Domaine Ott, this is their Bandol Rosé. So Bandol is a specific sub-appellation within the broader Provence, which is, we all know, Provence mm, Rosé. Like oh my God. Yeah. That's summer that's, right there. That, it, that is summer Ooh, in a glass. It'll right take there. you to fall in a glass. A little, little peach. Mm. There's a little peach in there. I taste a little peach. Yeah, yeah. Definitely a lot of that herb to Provence. This is actually Eric Repair's uh, favorite rosé. 
say. He's oh, like, Eric Repair? He's yeah, like, we he's love He's like very uh, vocal about his love for mm, Domain Odd. That's gorgeous. Um, and then this one, I think, is just something that has to be chatted about. So this is actually coming from Lebanon. Really? Yes. Have mm. you ever had a Lebanese wine? Let's knock that off the, uh, the bucket list. So Chateau Moussard is actually known for their ageable rosés, mm. their ageable whites. Isn't I like that? that. Delightful? Yeah. Mm. It is very complex. It's very rich. Mm -hmm. It's very dense. There's so much mm. happening in that glass. Um, it's just one of those things where you think, wine from Lebanon. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily think of that. I had great grapes there, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> Hold yeah, yeah, yeah. Look what Vanessa made the to, to keep a rosé cold. Wait, you, wait, first of all, you made this? I made this. How I'm, did you I'm, make you know, this? I'm not exactly like the hobbyist person, but we figured it out. It's Because like, so, it's so easy. That's the thing. This is something that you could do at home. Um, so you just want to take your favorite sort of home. flowers. Mm -hmm. I picked colors that were half summer, half fall to sort of make that transition. Yeah. Um, and then you use this mold um, and you oh. actually, you fill it with water. You put your flowers inside. I recommend starting halfway. So fill it halfway with water because the flowers, since they're so light, they float. Oh. So if you fill it halfway with water, put your favorite flowers inside, put it in the freezer, let it freeze, take it back out, fill Do it with water layer. again. Exactly. God, this so is a process. It oh, was no. a process, but you know what? It was really fun. And I feel like you could do it this huh. for almost any holiday. You know, you could make little rings of different berries Wait, or whatever and then you, you want. Put the, the wine bottle right in the center? Yeah, you just take the wine That's bottle and put it right in the middle. That's allowing me to demonstrate. Yes. It literally just, and then it just stays chilled. I can't. And what a that conversation is the cutest. Right? And they say it. it lasts about six hours. So Love this, it. you know, it'll make it through your whole fet and this nice little um, bucket yeah. as it'll catch the water as it drains Vanessa, so it's not gonna make a mess. You're too good, Vanessa. <laughs> Thank too you, good. Vanessa. Thank you. Um, now maybe we should toast some birthdays, Deidre. Yeah. I, I think, think we should. We'll take that non-alcoholic uh -huh. one, the first uh -huh. one, because we are celebrating some first birthdays oh, for you. Happy first birthday to Luca Pensabene of Ridgewood, New Jersey. He'd rather play with his dog, Ellie, than any other toy in the toy box. So cute. Claire Griffith is from Jackson, Mississippi. She loves to entertain her family with her singing and dancing skills. I'd love to see those. Happy first birthday to Ethan Pernikoff of St. Louis, Missouri. He's known for making friends with everyone he meets, but he's already got a best friend in his big sister, Cameron. Adorable. Heading to Baltimore, Maryland now, where we find Hayden Birch. He's a curious little guy, always ready to try something new. Fiona Burley is from New Windsor, New York. She likes to help mom and dad make their morning cup of joe. Next up, we hear she's going to make some breakfast, too. That'll be helpful. And last but certainly not least, happy first birthday to Sophia and Sarah Gavrilovic, adorable twins from Lake Worth, Florida, who never stop smiling. They have many talents, but the best one, according to their parents, sleeping through the night. We just hope that one sticks around. So happy birthday to all of them. Coming up. In our third hour, we are moving on this Monday with a start today dance workout. And then coming up on the fourth hour from retreats to motivational routines, an entire hour of making space. So we certainly have you covered. And uh, that's all coming up in the third and fourth hours of today. But first, your local news and weather. This morning on the third hour of today, historic storm. For the first time in nearly a century, a tropical storm hits California. Dangerous floods causing landslides and destroying roads. And the strong earthquake rattles nerves. We're tracking it all. Also, crackdown. Airlines taking action to combat skip lagging. We'll explain what it actually is and why it's so controversial. Then, in our series, Through Mom's Eyes, Chanel sits down with a mom who raised a trio of superstars. I'm a sucker for you. Yeah. Denise Jonas, mom to the Jonas Brothers, on when she knew they were special. And speaking of music, we are throwing a start today dance party. Peloton star Emma Lovewell is here to show us some old moves and a fun new workout. It's all ahead today, Monday, August 21st, 2023.
Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. And a good Monday morning. Welcome to this third hour of today. Craig Melvin, Chanel Jones, yeah. Dylan Dreyer, uh, Albert Roker Jr. A birthday guy. Celebrating yes. his birthday. You're older today. Yeah. <laughs> and he dropped Nick off at college yesterday. Yes, yes, so yes. Al is taking the morning off. You've been covering for It's down. been a busy morning. Yeah, I've been watching it all weekend. In fact, several states are still dealing with the remnants of Tropical Storm Hillary. Southern California got hit hard overnight. Some areas saw more than a foot of rain in just a matter of hours. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is live in San Bernardino, which is east of Los Angeles. Aaron, what's the situation like right now? Hey there. Well, commuters here in Southern California are waking up to scenes like this. This lake is so full that it overflowed onto this roadway. Just one example of flooding from Tropical Storm Hillary with more than 25 million Americans on flood watch from California all the way up to Idaho. Authorities are especially concerned about the low-lying desert areas as well as the mountains in one part of the mountains near San Bernardino County. A fire station had been completely cut off by a mudslide. And in Palm Springs overnight, the 911 system went down. Now, as the rains were pouring in here in Southern California yesterday, there was also an earthquake, a 5.1 magnitude quake to the north of Los Angeles in Ohio, California. Although there are no reports of significant damage or injuries, that is not the case here. When it comes to this tropical storm, authorities will be assessing damage for days. Mm. Guys. Erin, mm, thank you so much. Uh, now I just want to show you where the storm's headed because it is actually moving northward pretty quickly. In fact, the rain is coming to an end across parts of California, but now it's going to race up into areas like Idaho, northern Nevada, also eastern Oregon, where we could end up with about three to four inches of rain, but it is fast moving, so it's not going to like That's sit good. and linger and produce days and days of rain. It's just going to kind of move in and out, but still. Uh, something, you know, southern California, those mountains, yeah. they don't see a lot of this so yeah. it that's why it was so devastating imagine taking a dry sponge and blasting the faucet on it and the water just sort yeah. of goes so all it can't over. even absorb it, it. Can't absorb it fast analogy. enough so it just runs off and causes all that damage i mean i guess the, the plus side is there's some still some wildfires in the northwest so they maybe, do need the rain yeah yes so for sure all right um all right so that's a big story that we're following the other big story that scary moment mm -hmm. on a football field this is the uh, preseason of the nfl and this was a game between the the patriots and the green bay packers it, happened over the weekend rookie player Isaiah Bolden he tries to make a tackle and then he plays motionless scary. on the field for several minutes NBC Sam Brock is live now and it's Sam, we actually I mean that, that's one moment we saw a few scary moments like this over the weekend what's the latest Sure. I mean, anytime, Craig, and guys, good morning. You're seeing players kneeling on the field, huddled around one another, hands in their faces, praying. You know that it's serious and it is evocative in some respects of what happened with DeMar Hamlin, at least in terms of that league-wide response that happened seven months ago. These are two very different situations that occurred over the weekend. Two different players. Isaiah Bolden, as Craig mentioned, is one of them. He's a cornerback for the New England Patriots, a rookie, went to make a tackle against the Packers, actually collided with his own teammate and ended up lying lying there motionless four minutes on the field. He was stretchered off and ultimately goes to a hospital where he is released on Sunday. So good news there. The Patriots guys right now are not specifying exactly what kind of an injury he suffered, though he is right now in concussion protocol. We're told precautionarily, so no other specifics on that. And then there's John Wolford, who was a quarterback for the Bucs. He took a hit from the side against the Jets over the weekend, basically fell face first onto the field, suffered a neck injury. He was also carted off of the field, did give the thumbs up, and now now he is also out of the hospital. Apparently, his arm went numb, according to the coach, for a period of time. But he's doing okay as well. I mean, these guys are getting stronger and faster. They're like, they're like machines, Sam. The NFL has put in uh, place new safety measures in recent seasons to combat injuries, like what happened to DeMar Hamlin, as you mentioned last year. So what are they saying now about how these latest injuries were handled? 
Sure. So, Chanel, the protocols worked in this case. You know, the NFL ultimately has the final say on whether or not to suspend play. That is exactly what they did right away. But the league says they've made great strides when it comes to both equipment and rules. On the equipment side of things, you know those guardian caps, they look kind of funny that the players are wearing in training caps. It's like a camp, rather. It's like a soft shell cover over their helmets. But that has reduced concussions in camp some 52%. Also, new rules for kickoffs this year. If a player fair catches the ball before the 25-yard line, they're auto automatically starting with the ball on the 25. It's five yards further, which is to say they're trying to reduce the number of people running and having violent collisions. So there are rules in place. More to come, guys, to try to keep players safe. Good. All right. All right. Sam Rob Forrest there in, in Florida. Sam, thank you. And it's a trickle-down effect. I mean, I think about all the high schoolers around the country right now. Kids are going back to school. They're playing in middle school yeah. and yeah. Pop Warner Leagues all over the country. But so. you made a good point. I mean, these, these guys are getting they're bigger, they're stronger, they're faster. So it's something yeah. to watch. Yeah. All right. Well, now let's turn to another big talker today in the travel industry. Airlines are trying to shut down a practice called skip flagging. So essentially, flyers have been doing it for years to save money on flights. NBC News senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn is here to break it down for us. I think some people who have never heard of it are, are saying what? And then if you know, you know. If yeah. you know, you know. And there's actually <laughs> even industries that have sprung up around it trying to hook people up. Good morning to you. Skip lagging. It's long been viewed as an open secret in the airline industry. Industry, a smart but risky hack when it comes to airfare. It can help you save hundreds of dollars on your tickets, but a lot of airlines are now saying, hey guys, this is against our policies, and one airline has filed a lawsuit. It's been called an open secret in flying for years. Do you know what hidden city ticketing is? Hidden city ticketing, also known as skip lagging. You said we were flying New York to Denver. Yeah, I know we are. My boarding pass says we're flying to Los Angeles with a layover in Denver. When a traveler purchases a ticket with a connecting flight, but gets off at the layover airport rather than the final destination. You can often save hundreds of dollars per ticket. That's why hidden city ticketing works. For instance, a nonstop flight from Atlanta to Orlando might cost $250, but a flight from Atlanta to Dallas with a layover in Orlando could be nearly half the price at 130. For some, the choice is simple, buy the cheaper ticket and skip the second flight to Dallas. But that decision comes at your own risk. Most major carriers, including American, Delta, United, and Southwest Airlines, all prohibit the practice. And though it's not illegal, now American is cracking down, filing a lawsuit against the travel website Skiplagged, accusing the company of unauthorized and deceptive ticketing practices and tricking customers into believing they've gained access to a secret loophole. You look fresh. I travel with Skiplagged. Skiplagged promises ridiculous travel deals and says it exposes inefficiencies in airline pricing, such as hidden city flying. The site also lists precautions, including this warning. You might upset the airline, so don't do this often. And failure to comply with airline rules can have consequences. They can deny you boarding. They can confiscate frequent flyer miles, even in some cases suspend you for a length of time from flying that airline. In June, American Airlines canceled a North Carolina teen's trip and made him purchase a direct flight to his actual destination after discovering his hidden city ticket. The family claims they purchased his ticket from Skip Lag and says they weren't aware they were doing anything wrong. Cassia Rand also bought a ticket from Skip Lag to save some money. But when she checked in at the airport, she says American Airlines knew she was planning to ditch her second flight. She's like, if you don't go to Boston, you'll be banned from American Airlines forever. Aran was able to cancel her trip, but says she's now learned her lesson about skip lagging. Would never recommend like doing it. Well, we reached out to skiplag.com for comment. We have not heard back. Meanwhile, American Airlines tells us hidden city tickets can create larger operational issues with checked bags. It can also prevent other travelers from booking seats when they have an urgent need to travel. So the other options for you, if you're flying domestically, try to search for a one-way flight instead really? of a round trip. Yes, on two different airlines, sometimes the cheapest destination could be there. I mean, it's frustrating, right? Because consumers are like, why would I pay more no. to go, you know, further, further when I can 
can right. just go just short here. distance. It's all consumer price, like travel and demand. I don't understand the operational issue with check bags because if you're skip lagging, you're taking a carry yeah, on. Yeah, you're carrying. Absolutely, anyway. you're, you shouldn't be checking bags right. when yeah. you do check bags properly. I'm we not all know what bags happened. Anymore, anyway. Yes, oh, in God. Italy, God. right? Oh, we're we're never going to let that die. We're never yes. going to let that die for the next <laughs> eight years. I know, Vicky. Thank you. <laughs> all right, up next on today. Once they show up. Oh my God! Somebody, please find your bag. How to break up with your doctor? What you need to do if you want to find someone new? And then later, one of my new favorite people, the Jonas Brothers' mother. Denise Jonas sits down to look back on their rise to fame and when she knew her kids had real talent at an early age. Maybe we can learn something from her. We'll be right back. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? But it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. This morning on today's checklist, we are talking about breakups, <laughs> but not, not the kind you probably kind. think about. No, no, no. <laughs> We're going to tell you what to do when your relationship with your doctor has obviously run its course. <laughs> so we brought in the expert, board certified colorectal and general surgeon, Dr. Cedric McFadden. He's here to help guide us through the breakup process. <laughs> we should note you've never had a patient break up break with up. you. <laughs> it's never... not you. Yes. It's not you. But it's I mean, me. Let's start. The, when is the best time to call it quits with your doctor? How mm. do you know when it's time? Yeah, and, and, and these are not decisions that we take very lightly, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's several indications of when it might suggest it's a good time to consider seeing someone new. Number one, if there's been a lack of confidence or trust mm -hmm. in the decision-making process, it may be an indication that you should probably see someone different. I mean, let's face it, if you don't believe what the doctor's telling you, you're gonna be less likely to follow through with those that's recommendations, true. which could be harmful for your health, that's right? True. So that's a good indication. Number two, if there are communication issues. If you're bringing concerns and questions and it's repeatedly not, uh, you know, it's being ignored or disregarded, that also may be a time. Additionally, I think we'd like to see progress in our yeah. medical conditions. And if there's no progress despite ongoing treatment. Now that's interesting. That's so you've time. been going to a doctor for years and yeah. you go there, your numbers haven't changed, right. things haven't changed. Is that what it is? Or I think, I think that's what we have to reflect. Even as a doctor, I have to say, well, what am I missing? And that's a time we talk about second opinions, right? Mm. Is there a time to get a fresh set of eyes on this? You know, I don't want anybody to feel anxious about this. This should be a hopeful process right. because the focus should be on you, the patient. Yeah. Okay. We should have paired uh, patient decision shared to make uh, that process. We want to do that together. Okay. So really be hopeful about your health in this. So time. then let's say then you know you need to find a new doctor. Yeah. Should you start looking first or do you know what I mean? And how do you even start that process of finding someone else? Well, I think a good place to start, especially if you're looking for a specialist, is to talk with your current doctor, right? Because they're going to know. Wait, really? If, if, if you're looking for a specialist, a specialist. in something, right? Mm -hmm. It may be helpful to, because they're going to know the local experts, they're going to know who, they, they, they know your medical condition yeah. already. That's a good place to start. Also, talking to your family and friends. Yeah. Um, they know your quirks, right? Mm -hmm. And they perhaps know some of what your concerns are going to be, and they may recommend folks that they've seen. Also, you know, pay attention to what's happening online, right? The medical societies, the medical boards, they have information about doctors that are in the area, and let's not forget about your insurance coverage. I mean, they give you ways to see people. It's going to be cheaper, perhaps mm -hmm. less mm -hmm. out-of-pocket expenses, yeah. mm -hmm. and they give you a list of people that you can then choose from. So let's yeah. say you get all this advice, you do all the research, yeah. you find all of these great doctors, but I mean, you 
can you go to each one and just see how you click with them? I mean, how do you really narrow down the search yeah. so you can find one? Well, look for what you need, right? Take a moment. If you know you need a certain experienced doctor, look for doctors that have certifications. Doctors, if you're looking for minimal invasive surgery, look for doctors that have done additional training mm -hmm. outside of medical school. You can find that on their websites. Mm -hmm. You also want to review patient reviews yes. online the positive and the negative to get a balanced perspective of it. And also look for doctors that are accommodating to what you need, either locally, if you know you need evening hours or weekend That's hours, That's true. then maybe transfer to a doctor that has that. But really you want to trust your instincts, okay. trust your gut and really go for them. Okay. So let's just say you've, you've done your homework, yeah. you've vetted everyone, you've talked to friends and family, and now you have to have that awkward conversation yeah. Yeah. with the old doctor. You can't just ghost them. Right, <laughs> right, right, don't ghost them. No. Or I guess you could ghost him or her, but that's probably not the best no. approach. How do you break up with your old doctor? Well, I mean, speaking of ghosts, I mean, sometimes if I have a patient I've not seen in a while, I'll say, whatever happened to, and I'll look, and you know, I think the ultimate goal is realizing your doctor is in this with you, and, and I don't want to paint all of us with the same brush. We're not yeah. monolithic, but as a whole, your doctor's in this process with you, so I think setting a separate time, don't tag this along with your yearly physical, mm -hmm. the last yeah. five minutes, oh, I'm seeing someone next. <laughs> Make a maybe a dedicated appointment to have this conversation, Respect express that, that and know that they may be feeling the same thing. Yeah. They may be saying, you know, maybe we've reached the end of my expertise. Maybe we do need to bring somebody else in that can continue this relationship. This is a good conversation. Yeah. We've never had this it's conversation true. before, no. and I think and it's very real. Important. Very yeah. important. Well, it's good. Thank you, Thank Dr. You so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right, coming up, it's Through Mom's Eyes. Denise Jonas, a.k.a. Mom to the Jonas Brothers, tells us all about what it was like in their house before the fame and her favorite moment from this wild ride. And then later, award winners for your feet. We're going to share some of the picks from this year's Self Sneaker Awards. I always love this segment. We'll be right back. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. It's like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. <laughs> this has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. No secret, we love the Jonas Brothers here at the third hour. And this morning, and through mom's eyes, Chanel Jones is going to introduce us to the matriarch of that famous family. It was a splendid afternoon. So we met up in North Carolina at their family restaurant, Nellie's Southern Kitchen. We talked about the early years, their rise, and those devoted legions of fans. I um, never wanted to have girls, daughters, because I just thought it would be fun to have boys. Four boys to be exact, Kevin, Joe, Nick, and Franklin. Before the band, there was a childhood of adventure. Life in our home was always exciting, laughter, things breaking. <laughs> I guess if you have four boys, a couch is not just a couch. Mm, well said. <laughs> what was your parenting style? I tend to be strict. And my husband and I felt like we're not just raising kids. We're raising adults. And we want to raise them with the integrity and the moral values that we have. Just tell me a little bit about music and how important it was to your family. Uh, my husband is 
the real musician, a music lover. He recognized that at an early age in Nicholas specifically, he was three and he was singing a song. He hit a wrong note and he went, he backed up and he sang it correctly at three. At three. And my husband was like, this one is beyond me. As the boys got older, their passion for performing only grew. They actually got signed to a manager and they immediately booked commercials and Nick really couldn't read that well at that time, but he could sing and he booked his first Broadway musical. So when did you know, you know what, I think we have something here. It was during that time, it was just like, ah, what, what more can we accomplish? Never thinking what would happen would happen. What happened was the Jonas Brothers, Kevin, Joe and Nick formed a band. How you feeling tonight? Eventually selling out arenas around the world. When we toured with them, I realized my role was being taken now by people that you, we paid. Mm -hmm. There's a, a catering company that cooks the meals and there's someone who dresses them, does their laundry, mm -hmm. irons everything. And it's like, okay, what do I do? It was tough. So what do you do? I mean, the good Lord made you their mother. <sighs> just, I had to enjoy it. And enjoy she did. Nearly 20 years later, the boys now have six successful albums and more than 13 billion streams globally. The screaming girls and the whole thing. What was that like as a mom? It really it fills my heart with joy That's when it? I see that. I remember being that girl. I want them to feel that way for my kids. Do any of them say they're the favorite? Oh, yes. I think they all think Nick's the favorite. <laughs> but I really don't have a favorite. I mean, there are different things for different ones. The fans, the memories, the music, all highs for the Jonas family, but one of the more trying times, Nick's diabetes diagnosis at 13. First you feel guilt. You go through this, session, this period where you as a parent think, what did I do to my child? And then you, get, you have anger and you're angry that this happened. And then you feel sorrow and grief because you've lost part of your child and you know that it's, it's something you're gonna deal with. It was tough. What got you through those moments? Faith plays like the major role in our lives as a family, it still does with my husband and I. And in the last few years, the family has grown even bigger. Does it feel good that they found Yes, Love. it feels absolutely wonderful because yeah. as a mom, I've raised you this way and I, how are you going to find that someone I'm that's you're an equal to yeah. you? I could not be more blessed. And they've given us five beautiful granddaughters. Favorite moment of this wild ride you guys had together? The great response of their fans loving them, but also the gift they're giving the people with what they were created to do. So the Jonas Brothers are on a massive tour, 90 shows. Can you imagine 90 shows performing five of their albums? And even though Denise doesn't have a favorite child, she does have a favorite song. She even sang it for me, and you can see she that. She sang it. Uh huh. Um, you can, can see that too. in our extended conversation. There's so much more. I wanted advice for all of us. Um, so that's on our streaming channel today all day uh, this morning at 10 o'clock. You can find it on Peacock or on your smart TV. Um, great. She is. Denise, if you're watching, delightful. And a lot of these moms, I think, I appreciate that they are willing to sit down and talk with us because sure. people automatically see the stars, but sometimes they're the wind beneath the wings, yeah. quite often, yeah. and the father too. And they're so. all, they all still seem so close. And they're good guys. Too. Yeah. Yeah, which is yeah. To hear her so. talk about, um, to open up in the way that she did to talk about sort of being replaced in some ways, mm -hmm. the catering. And, and I haven't heard moms, a lot of moms haven't talked about that, yeah. but it's yeah. definitely a, a feeling that you have. I was saying she reminds me of, you know, Dylan is cooking me and you you know you organize things and you kind of run it and then when you're not needed but then you can also accept that okay I don't have your to do job. that let me have fun yeah that, that's and that's just, exactly what she and did she is, so yeah. there you go it was great thank, thank you Denise you. all right well coming up it's the 2023 sneaker awards the best kicks for running walking even the beach and then later lace them up for start today we're turning Monday into fun day with Peloton instructor Emma Lovewell and a throwback dance workout okay we'll be right back all right get ready
you're back now with a treat for your feet. Whether you're running, walking, or just standing all day at work, a good sneaker can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And this morning, Self is out with their 2023 Sneaker Awards. Their team of editors, athletes, and experts chose the best of the best. So Self Editor-in-Chief Rachel Miller is here to walk us through some of the winners. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Rachel. We always love this segment because, you know, we're on our feet a yeah, lot. Absolutely. So it's nice to have a comfortable pair of sneakers, and it's mm -hmm. no surprise the Hoka Hoka's has a brand. Having such a moment right now. So these were our best high cushion walking sneaker. You can see that cushion. Mm -hmm. They've got a nice thick sole. This was my first time testing them. I love them. I see what the hype is all about. They're mm -hmm. so comfortable. They come in a lot of really beautiful and fun colors. So very beloved for a reason. And I they're really lightweight. Yeah, they don't mm -hmm. feel as chunky as they look. Full they feel disclosure, great I've been wearing Hoka's for years and like swear by them. Not just for running. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just like be bopping yes. around. Just because they're, are they cushiony? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I've got like a funky arch. Yeah. Not to get, not to give you that. My feet are wide. And funky feet. So I didn't say my feet were funky. <laughs> I said my arch was funky, to be clear. I also love the fact that you guys use, like, you use pregnant women to test the yes. shoes. You use a wide Real swath. Folks. Definitely. Real we folks. want to make sure people who are on their feet all day, healthcare providers, mm. we put them through their pace. Love this, that. Really. This yep. is probably my favorite on the table right now. Mm. I had not heard cool. of this brand before. It was new to me as well. This is York Athletics, the Henry so sneaker. These are our best gym to street sneakers. So you're picking up on the fact that they're very stylish. People said they wore them running and then to the office, but also sometimes just wore them to the office because they mm. like look how them cute so they are. are. Really yeah. cute. And, and unisex? Yes, they are. And they're designed in a way so that the laces shouldn't leave hot spots on the top of your feet. If it's summer, your foot's getting sweaty, they should actually let That's your feet breathe because of the smash upper. Cute. Dylan has yeah. that problem with her feet. They, <laughs> don't, don't drag me in. They sweat <laughs> profusely. So this shoe was voted best for training, is yes. that right? And that's for running, training For running, okay. So if you are trying to run a, you know, a half marathon or you're trying to run your best time, these are quote unquote super shoes. So they okay. have a carbon plate in them that actually gives you an energy return that will make you run faster. It's Ew. really wild. Um, so if you want to, wow. you know, have your best race, run a little faster, these are the ones for you. Wow, I'll awesome. take the nitro ones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about just going back to basics with just a good standard running shoe? Right. So they, these are great cross trainers. So if you're somebody who goes to the gym a lot, you do different machines, you take classes, you, you know, swing a kettlebell around. Mm -hmm. These are a really great all around Nike sneaker that highly recommend. People said that they could really feel their feet in them, which is so important mm -hmm. if you want to be safe when you're lifting weights. Um, but again, if you're only going to buy one shoe, this is a great pair. Okay, good okay. all around mm -hmm. shoe. This good is another too. brand someone turned me on to a few years ago, yeah. the On Clowns. Yep, this is another one oh, you're probably starting to see all over great the Great for travel, too. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So these are super lightweight. I Thank also you. tested these. They pack down so flat. Um, they're they're great if you're traveling and you're like, I want to bring more shoes. I don't want to overpack my suitcase. Mm -hmm. You want something cute that you can wear if you're going around ancient sites, but you also want to go for a run mm -hmm. in there. Um, and they're they're really breathable. They almost feel like being barefoot. They're amazing. I love these, like, multiple uses. I know. It's so good. And they come in so many colors, too. Yes, definitely. All so of these this last one, this one, you you gotta convince me on this one. My kids love these. Yeah. Okay. So if you've worn Crocs before, you know the probably the, the value of these kind have of like to look better on. They right? look great on. I know they're a little weird. They take. They are. Used to. My girlfriend actually tested these and was obsessed really? with them. Really? Yeah. They're great. Let me see. Are they they're comfy? Super comfortable. They're really they have comfortable. Really good arch support and they're great for um, gardening, that. wearing to the beach because they can get wet. We gave these best water shoe, but they're also great for running errands, walking your Wait, dog. You do make them around. cute here. Try you can wear them with socks too and like a sweatsuit, which is a really cute pairing. They're growing on. I feel like she's yeah. You can tell, right? They are. They are growing on. It helped that Dylan put them on. They're cute. But these yeah. are for women. Yes. You no. want to try them? These are the Would women's. You like to try them? Here. These are the women's. I'm, this is the, I'm, I'm, I'm 13. <laughs> you can try it. They, they do have them like, They're super this light. Is not and be and you can feel comfy. the air yes. going through. Yeah, them. and so they rinse off if you wear them on the beach and they so get full of sand. So for my sweaty feet, Craig. <laughs> I think this would yes, be perfect for your feet. Right <laughs> Rachel, these are good. You. Thank, Thank you so much. They do look cute on you, though. They look really good. Thank you so much. For more on the Sneaker Award winners, you can head to today.com slash shop. And now that we have the right sneaker, it is time for Start Today. Peloton Ooh, instructor Emma Lovewell is here yeah, with a throwback <laughs> dance workout that you are going to love. And then a little bit later, it's a sweet treat in Cooking with Cal, a dessert that my family has been serving for, I mean, I guess generations. This is really? an old recipe. Yeah. We'll be right back. What size are they? You should, you should try those.
You guys know we always love to get moving on Monday morning, and this week we have a start today dance workout. Emma Lovewell is a professional dancer and Peloton instructor. She recently released her first book. It's titled Live or Live, Learn, Love Well: Lessons from a Life of Progress, Not Perfection. Emma, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to today. Thank you. you. We're so excited you're yes. here. Thank I love you for that. So me. we're gonna dance in just a bit. So clear out your living room. The beautiful part about dancing with her, nobody has to see you, so mm -hmm. she'll show you some moves. But let's talk about that. Progress, not perfection. Why is that so important to you? I think I've been a perfectionist at times in my life, and there's no such thing as perfect, mm. right? I've never met anybody who's like, I'm perfect now, yep. I'm good. And so I think a lot about fitness and just life is the lessons along the way. And yeah. so that's what I'm sharing in my book. I love that. Can I brag on you for just a second? Yeah. She's danced for folks like Snoop, uh, Rolling Stones, yeah. all of those folks. So do you think, and especially because we're talking about the 50th anniversary of hip hop and yes. some of these moves, yes. it all kind of works together. Yes, I was a professional dancer for a long time and I write a lot about that in my book. And um, we're gonna go over some old school hip hop <laughs> okay. dance moves together. All right. So move your furniture okay. if you're at home, you know, tell your pets to get out of the way. <laughs> and uh, let's get started. Oh my God, the first started. one I just saw the prompter. <laughs> DJ, hit it, let's go. Oh, you gotta turn it up really loud. I'm about to look ridiculous. <laughs> I can't do this. I've heard that you guys are great dancers. Uh, okay. Not the Humpty, <laughs> the Humpty dance. Okay, Ooh, so doing that. here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna cross and then open, and then you just groove. Ready? Again. <laughs> cross, <laughs> open, me. groove. Okay, so the, groove this way just, it doesn't matter. It's All just right. like the freestyle. Right. So the trick is it's on the and one, two, three, four, and five, six, seven, eight. And one, Come on, two, eight. eight, and <laughs> five, six, oh. seven, eight, and one, two, there we yeah, go. Yeah, hey. girl. Hey. 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 Everybody, a whole thing. Yes. Yeah. Everybody, right? All right, what's the next one? Okay, so the I next we were gonna... move. Okay, yes, go ahead. you could do that too. Mm. And you've probably seen that move. Actually, they use it a lot in music videos. Outkast does it in there. So fresh and so clean. Okay, so that next move is Roger Rabbit. This takes some core strength. I'm not gonna lie, because it takes balance. <laughs> But you're gonna no. Roger Dylan and I have bonded on the stance. Go oh, ahead. great! You kick back. I haven't done this in a while. And then you jump on that foot. Okay. Kick back, jump on that foot. Kick back, jump. Do you disagree with this one? No, I'm, I'm no. I'm and just then, letting you have your moment. So, but then up to tempo. Seven, eight, and one, and two. Oh, you're doing and, this oh, one. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, Chanel. <laughs> And facilitate. That one okay. is tricky though. Okay. That's probably the hardest one I think in this in this lineup. If we want to go to the next one, we got the cabbage patch. This is so classic. Classic. You're just gonna circle your arms around to one side. Let's all go to, to the left and then go to the right. To the right. <laughs> Did you ever to the right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we'll pick up the tempo. Left. Left and right. And left. Artist right things are different. Left and right. What is <laughs> right. Dylan is churning butter and it's okay. <laughs> All right. Chanel tried to teach me to do the running man once and this failed. How did it so go? Miserably. I mean, well, so Dylan goes so, like this. Okay. Instead of pushing it back. Right. And so I'm trying to show right. her how to push I don't know it back. What you're talking it's like about. the old school shuffle in a way. So you go back, back, back. I brought some help. Ah, yes! I brought some help. Yes! 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 Emma have been like besties. They're like besties. Oh, the best surprise! Okay, we're doing the running man. 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 Of course, hey. Allie's got to do it in here. There you go. Hey, hey. come on, Trent. Hey. <laughs> then we're gonna travel with the running man. Hey. Hey. I love, I love running man. Oh my God! No, we're doing it. Why they have to love that? Emma, thank you so much. She was like, "Oh, Allie's my friend." I'm like, "Really?" <laughs> you can join our Start Today community by scanning the QR code below or head to today.com slash start today. Oh, good job. Yes. At least Fred is high mind. At least she did it. I had to bring out. Sure. All right. Oh, my God. I can dance, but I certainly can eat. So we've got one of our my favorite recipes from our house in this week's Cooking with Cow. We're making a sweet, creamy dessert that's been a staple in my family since I was a little kid. We'll be right back. Should Yum. We're in the break. Should we, break? we should run yeah. to the yeah. break. Let's see you're running. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hey!
I'm back in my comfort zone now. <laughs> I need to shake that off. All right, it is time for another edition of Cooking with Cal. This time we made a dessert that has been in my family for ages. In fact, I used to help my mom make it when I was little. Take a look. It's another edition of Cooking with Cal. What are we making today? Caramel flan. Do you even know what caramel flan is? No. It's like a custard with homemade caramel on the top. So I've been making this since I was little, like your age, right? And the recipe my mom sent me is so old and tattered. It just shows you how long we've been making this. The first thing we have to do is make a water bath. Do you know what a water bath is? No, I know what a water bath is. Okay. It's a bath filled with water. Yes, for our pan. So why isn't it just not called a bath? That's a good point. All right, we're making a bath for our pan. So what we're gonna do is put the dish in a big pan filled with about an inch of water. And I'm gonna put this in the oven to warm up. So I'm gonna pop this very carefully in here. Come on over, we're gonna make some caramel. So you're gonna watch me make the caramel. Dump all the sugar right in. It's not hot, okay. Okay, so Calvin, I'm gonna take this carefully. So the reason this was in the oven is because if I poured this hot molten sugar yeah. into a cold pan, it might crack the pan. All right, we're done with the hot stuff. You ready to step in and do yeah. some things? Ready for the next ingredients? Uh. Sugar. Oh, wow. Yay. All right, so evaporated milk is like canned milk. It stays on the shelf, and they evaporate some of the water out of it, so it's pour. a little bit thicker than regular milk. Or all of it? All of it, please. I got it, I got okay, it. Okay, okay. Mmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> Calvin, I'm gonna bring our hot pan back over. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna pour this in. I wanna pour it. Just don't touch the pan, okay. <gasps> Hear a crackle? Yeah. What, you're gonna pour all of it? Look at how it cracks on the side, how cool is that? No, that's the last thing. No, that's the caramel sugar we made. Now, we're gonna cook that for an hour. And then we're gonna pop it in the fridge once it's cool. <laughs> so what I need you to do is take the knife and cut all around the edge. Okay. As close to the edge as you can get. Turn the corner. It, it, it looks like bread, weird. And take this. <laughs> Three, oh! Oh my, oh my God. Okay. Ready? Watch this. Watch the magic happen. Oh. Isn't that beautiful? What's that? Thank you, Cal. All right, try it out. See what you think. Delicious. Delicious? Do you love it? Mm -hmm. For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash Oh, they got to all oh so cute. But it's like a little magic experiment, you know, for the kids to see it all come together. This is delicious. Do you no. want me to tell my story? Yes. I don't think so you should. I, I, don't think, I, I have a I scar. Just for the, for the record, I don't think you should tell the story. I have a scar on my finger, okay. and it's from actually melting the sugar to make caramel, and it splashed into my finger, and I've had a scar ever since. When you were making it with your mom? I was making because she left you in the she kitchen by four. yourself? She said, Dylan, go make the sugar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go, go make the caramel. This, this is, is yummy, really good. I think about it every day when I look at my hand. Aw. So, this this also helps, it teach, probably helps to teach Cal patience. That's true. That is true. You know? This was a lot of it work. doesn't want to wait. Yeah. And I like the coconut in here, too. Yeah, we added the coconut. That's the original recipe, but I well don't like coconut. It well done, Cal. We'll be right back. This is delicious. Really, really I good. Needed to
we got the week started off pretty well. Yeah. Tomorrow, coming up here on the third hour of today, singer-songwriter Sam Ryder will perform live. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, Mel Robbins shares her five-second rule that has motivated millions of her fans. All right, does it feel like a mun yay to you? It does. Hopefully it was a yay to you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. making space for you. Find out how some of the most successful women like Bobby Brown, Lindsey Vaughn, and Allie Love make space for themselves. Plus, we've got your Monday motivation with Mel Robbins, who shares her top tips for a healthy morning routine. And Jenna and I find a calm oasis in the heart of New York City to help us reconnect with our mind, body, and soul. So it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. So good. Everybody, welcome. Can you believe it? It's hard to believe it. it's the it's the third week in August. August. 21st. Oh my gosh, happy Monday, everybody. It's the end of the summer. You know what? Here's the thing about this. Remember how we always say savor and linger? Yeah. Slow it down. Don't rush. You know, we're, you know, here's what we do. I can't wait for, how about when we play the game? I can't wait for. I can't wait for school to yeah. get out. I can't wait for summer. I can't wait because I can't July. wait for July. I can't wait for my vacation. Yeah. I can't wait. It's like, let's stop leaping ahead. Yes, let's just live. Let's in live it. in today. Monday, August, August 21st. 21st. Here it's we are. It's a good are. day. And we have a really great show because it's all about how to make space, which I think, you know, even in the summer when I summer's my favorite, Mine favorite too. season. Mine too. It's Mine yours. Too. Yeah. Because it feels a little freer. Yes. There's not so many structures. You can do things that are a little wild. Your yes. kids can look at the stars at night Stay instead of going up later. to bed. Yes. You're not rushing, but rushing. But here's the thing about making space. It is an action. Mm. It, you don't get space because you sit in your house and go, oh, I wish I could. You have to say, here's my day. Here's what I'm blocking off. Yeah. If you don't do it in the morning, you're not doing it. Yeah, totally. If you keep saying, I'm going to do it later, I'll figure it out in the afternoon. Totally. No, no, no. In the morning, and then you block your time for yourself. Yes. And once you block it, nothing gets in. Can I say It's like a doctor's appointment. Nothing gets in. You do this. Mm -hmm. My dad does it. <laughs> Why do me and your dad always do the same things? <laughs> I knew you were going to like that. Well, okay, what is he here's doing? the thing. Tell me. Guess how you're going to make space for yourself. How? You have to wake up earlier. You've told me that for a long time. But the I, only, I know, I know you've, I'm just singing to the choir, but if you're wondering, yeah, when oh can my I have gosh, time? I'm exhausted. I'm, when could I possibly meditate? There's when no could time. I write in my journal? When could I go to the gym? Absolutely. I feel like my happiest, yes. I'm in a really good rhythm because I wake up at the crack of dawn yes. and I get straight yes. to those things. Yes, I agree. I, you're a thousand percent right. You have to wake up yeah, earlier. If you think you don't have time, you have to back it Set up. Set your alarm 30 minutes. It's not good. It, nothing. And don't don't hit snooze. No. Remember, Mel Robbins says, if you hit snooze, the very first decision you're making your day is, I'm going to procrastinate. Yes. And it's and by the way, you actually don't feel more rested after no. you've hit snooze. Because guess what? You're only going to sleep for about 10 or 15 and it minutes doesn't, longer. And then it feels worse. Yeah, you're Why are we tired. yelling? You dream. Because. Um, okay, so it is time for something we love to do around here. Yeah. Hoda and, and Jenna's social <laughs> dilemmas. Okay. Why is that graphic like? It's like from the 60s. It makes me want to dance. Yeah. Okay. At a roller skating rink. What you got? Okay, here's the first one. Mm -hmm. I had made plans with friends a few months ago. Wait, pause. You make a, pa a plan a few months ago? Well, I, this isn't me. Okay, go on. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but although I, sometimes we make plans in advance. Yeah. Okay. This week, I decided I need to, an alone day, so I canceled the plans with her. Now she's upset with me. Did I do anything wrong? Okay. So the question is, is when did you cancel? Mm -hmm. If you canceled hours before or 
you cancel the night before. Remember we did, we had that sort of New York Times rule well, last spring rem- that was, was like, if you're canceling, canceling 24 hours, no, no, if you're canceling before 2 p.m. for a night plan, you're not rude. Yeah. So Well, 2 p.m., but if you, it's been on the books for months, and that means the person was excited. Looking forward to it. It wasn't like a, you want to have dinner on Thursday. It was. But here's the thing. I kind of feel like. If you know you need alone yeah. time, Take alone you time. know you need alone time, and maybe just say that. Say, I'm, I haven't had any space for myself. Yeah. I'm totally I exhausted. Yeah. I won't be a fun hang. I won't be fun. Yeah, that's actually, that's a perfect way to do it. And then put another day on. Yeah. Can we do it? Next Let's find week. another day. But make sure before you put the other day that you're not going to want to cancel that. And you too. might. And if you cancel enough times on your friend, you probably don't want to hang out with her. <laughs> that's happened. Have you ever done that? You keep canceling on someone, and you're like, maybe I just don't want to go. Yeah. That happens. But I just don't want to go really anywhere. Anywhere. Okay. Me either. Okay, here's the next one. <laughs> Whenever my husband is watching our kids, he calls me with a million questions. How do I have the conversation with him that he needs to step up to the plate and figure it out himself? I think a lot of women have this. Yeah. They either want to ask you, like, where's the, where's this? Where do you keep the other glove? I can't find her shoes. Or they, they want just want to add a boy. Yeah, they want to be like, well, I got their coats on and yeah. off. And we yeah. went to the you park. You wouldn't believe our day today. First, we did this. Second, we did that. And here's the problem. When women leave... We want to be gone. We don't want to know we about don't the want day. It, we don't want to know one thing because it interested. just stresses us out. So here's and what also, I have had to do this. So what did you do? So I've just said, honey. I love you. I love you. Mm-hmm. When you're away, mm-hmm. I, I've sent cute videos of the kids saying they miss you and love you because I know that's what you want. But I'm not asking a million questions mm-hmm. and I'm not sending want, you yes. the play by play. Right. Because it actually makes me feel kind of bad to be away. Yeah. And I don't want to feel bad. Yes. And anybody that loves you. By the way, good. That's I don't great. Feel I don't want to I don't want to feel bad. Just send me the videos yeah. and tell me that they're having a great time and they can't wait to see yes. me. Don't tell me about. And then we had caught. We went to the cutest little place. And, had and also, some of the times it's like, well, and then she was late to school. Yeah. And the problem is, all that does is make you feel Stressed. like, have, if, had you been there, she wouldn't have been late. She wouldn't have been late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. By the way, that was great advice. Oh, well, thank Excellent. you. Excellent. All right. <laughs> so if you guys have a social dilemma, we want to hear from you. All you have to do is head to Hodenjenna. Dot com and hit the connect button. All right, coming up next, the special guests who've been making space with me. Oh my gosh, she's going to reflect on some of the people who've inspired her to make changes in space in her life right after this. to today every day we are adding to the star power in our studio the biggest names only on today see we're coming to this early right everybody it's today like i won the lottery how do you feel at this age this stage liberated we're just getting started folks ain't no stuff with us now (laughs) the boys are back in town boys are back in town it's a miracle miracle. this has been fantastic everything and everyone you're talking about only on today when we talk about making space, Hoda, so much of the wisdom that you share with me comes directly from guests on your podcast. That's kind of how I feel. Sometimes when I'm just sitting down with them, I'm saying, wow, I can't believe they said that. It sticks with me. It inspires me. And then I kind of get to reflect on my own life. So we learned a lot of lessons over the years. Here they are. Take a look. I am on a constant quest. And I think it's a lifelong quest for like inner wisdom. I was trying to slow down because I was tired. (laughs) I was trying to fit every single thing in. 
And the idea of slowing down made me think you can't handle it. And then all of a sudden it just, you get to a point in your life where you're like, this is not sustainable for me. I can't do it. Like I cannot keep going like this. So I just thought, make some space. The thing that grounds me is that Maria sees me. When I look at someone like Oprah and Maria, Oprah's fantastic and Maria's fantastic. But what's between them is ultra fantastic. And I thought to myself, sometimes you need space to tell someone, you matter. Like, I need you. This is how much you mean. When I think about George Clooney and Julie Roberts, I'm sorry. To watch a friendship in action is to me like one of the joys of life. That's when I was ashamed of um, my mental health. When I think about what Rosie went through, I wanted to cry what she'd been through. But at the end, I had no sadness. Like, I was like, you go, girl. Like, I couldn't believe what she was able to overcome in that life. When I listened to Viola Davis talk about a childhood and to watch what she endured and to watch her where she is today and to look at a woman with tender eyes, her eyes are soft. Her eyes aren't hard from years of abuse. She's somehow soft and she's driven. Maybe I thought that if you lived a really hard life, that sometimes you got broken and you couldn't put it back together. Those women showed me that, uh-uh, no, 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 no. It's like when they are on their knees, it's like that's the moment. That's the moment everything changes. And I knew by then that courage was fear that has said its prayers. Anne Lamott was on the show, and she has brilliant wisdom, humor, loved her, loved her, loved her. So when my daughter was sick, um, she texted me, you okay? And then one day I texted her back and said, yes, are you there? And she called immediately. And we talked for a while and prayed for a while. I was just weeping, but she said, I'm gonna send you something in the mail. It's a little medallion that says, God's got it, and it's worn out. And she says to me, it's worn because I've been wearing it. And to realize that someone who you had on your podcast one day has got my back. I mean, how amazing is that? I think it takes courage to unearth all the stuff that you want to stuff down, that you spent a lifetime putting away, and saying that you're not afraid of it. It doesn't own you. You're not defined by that. And I think once you push it out, you're like, oh, I feel lighter. I learned that the bandwidth for your heart to expand is endless. When I sat down with somebody who lived a life that's the opposite of mine or a life I'd never have the opportunity to live, and they say, here's the one thing I learned. You go, what is it? It's like another light goes on, and I promise you, this is like a lifelong journey. I'm on the train, and I'm, I'm not getting off. I mean, can you imagine? That is such a... a I know. I feel like it's a master class and, for anybody. Like, anybody. how lucky are you yes, and I know. all of us yeah. that you share that beautiful, beautiful conversation well, with us all? These people are incredible. I just want to say thank you to every single guest. Thanks for the life lessons. Many more to come. Okay, by the way, you can listen to all of the episodes of Hoda's podcast, Making Space, wherever you get your podcast. All right, coming up, Jen and I are going to share our mindful morning routines that might help you start your day better. Coming up after this.
good day. All right, the idea of making space starts from the moment you get up in the morning. It kind of sets the tone for the rest of your day. So our producers asked us what we do every morning, and that got us thinking, how do other women who we admire start their days? Yeah, start and end their days. So we reached out to them to find out. Bobby Brown is an entrepreneur and founder of Jones Road Beauty. Lindsey Vaughn is, of course, an Olympic gold medal skier. Maria Shriver is Hoda's best friend and a journalist, <laughs> the founder of the Sunday paper. Ali Love, who we love Adore. to do our Pelotons, is a businesswoman and, of course, a Peloton fitness instructor. And Sarah Blakely is the founder of Spanx. Wow, that is like <laughs> Mount Rushmore right there. Let's see how we all do it. In this wake up time. Okay, let's go. My mornings are uh, quiet. No one is up. Hold a candle. This is my little setup. This is where I like to sit. So um, I did the breathing and I checked in with my brain, my emotions, my spirit, my body. And I'm gonna get my journal, which is right here. Before I even let my feet touch the ground, I pray. The first thing I do when I get up is I hydrate, hydration station. I drink this whole thing of water before I go to work. All of my kids have to be out the door by 7.10. There is no candle lighting. There is no meditation for me. If I'm not burning the toast, I'm winning. I have three dogs and I'm usually being licked awake every morning. I try to get to the gym. That's a form of meditation and a place where I really get a lot of confidence. I sit down and read my iPad, the paper, then I go exercise. Like that is no matter what I do every single day. I do a active breath work and get ready to start my day, go to the gym. I go outside, I sit down, even if it's cold, I grab a blanket and I just sit in silence and I do Wordle. I ask myself a two-part question. How or what do I want to feel today? And what ends up happening is when I answer that question, I'm able to anchor my day. I am in search of time to daydream each day. I'm looking for an opportunity for my mind to wander. I'll do a 15 minute walk around my neighborhood. My mind wanders when I'm looking at nature or in nature. But when the sun goes down, it's all about the wind down. Okay, I'm about to go to sleep. Um, and uh, like many of you, the very end of my night is exhausting three bedtimes, reading, which I love to do with the kids. So at the very end of um, my night, I always end it reading. And I always take a shower, which I just did. And I'm gonna write, this sounds weird and it's not arrogant, but I write three things I appreciate about myself from today. I put on sleep music. It's like a deep sleep playlist that I listen to that sincerely puts me to sleep in three seconds. I end each day with a bath. I get in lavender scented Epsom salts and I take 15 minutes to myself every single night. I say goodnight to my dogs. I say goodnight to my God. I read a page or two from something that is beautiful. And someone that, you know, has raised three kids and, you know, works with a lot of people during the day. And it's kind of the only time I'm by myself. And I realize that sometimes I just need to be me and be by myself. And every once in a while I have a little company. <laughs> She's ready to do. I'm gonna turn off all the lights and I'm gonna go night night. I mean, how awesome. Didn't you learn like from everybody's routine? Yes, a little one something. little something mm -hmm. to take. So can we just thank all of those incredible women for sharing their routines with a us? Another successful friend of ours, Mel Robbins, she shares her steps to healthy morning routines and the five second rule right that she says person. every single person should follow. Coming up right after this.
Okay, it's hard to believe. Just 15 years ago, our friend Mel Robbins says she was rock bottom. She faced anxiety. She had unemployment. She was way in debt. But then she figured out not only how to survive, but to thrive. So today, Mel has sold millions of books, and her motivational talks have billions of views. Oh, she inspires us. That's billions, by the way, with a B. And she recently stopped by to share some secrets to her success specifically her all-important morning routine. I just feel so grateful that I'm able to share simple things with people around the world that have really made a difference in my life. What, yeah. What's the number one thing that people have come up to you and said, Mel, I'm so glad that you told me that because I've been applying that in my day-to-day -day life? It's without a doubt the five-second rule, which is a brain hack that I invented 14 years ago when anxiety consumed me. We were 800 grand in debt. And I couldn't get out of bed. So we're talking about morning routines and finding space for yourself. And I would literally spend an hour every morning staring at the ceiling, yeah. consumed with our problems and anxiety and depression. And the five second rule is a simple tool. Everybody needs to know it. Every kid needs to know it. You simply count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, mm -hmm. in a moment where you're hesitating or afraid, and then move. Just and, get up? Oh, absolutely, because something happens in your brain when you count backwards. You interrupt the patterns of worry yeah. and procrastination and beating yourself up, and you go five, four, three, two, one, and you require the prefrontal cortex to pay attention, oh. which is the part of the brain that gives you immediate control oh over gosh. what you do next. I love that. How brilliant and yeah. how simple. Okay, yeah. you say the key to successful days really yes. starts every single yeah. morning. What's your routine? Yeah, what do you do? Well, I want everybody to think about this like a domino. Mm -hmm. So what is the first decision that you make in the morning? Yeah. Because that one decision will actually trigger either negative so decisions true. or positive so, decisions. Yeah, so so like decision what? number one, get your rear end out of bed. Don't uh -huh. push snooze. Absolutely not. There's a lot of brain science around it. Uh, you actually, if you fall back asleep, you put yourself in a state of sleep inertia, uh -huh. which makes you, uh, for the next four hours, it makes your brain groggy oh. and it makes it, yeah, okay, yeah so, so snooze, get up but when you get up. Get up, okay. five, four, three, two, one, get out of that bed okay, and make your bed. Make I'm not trying to turn you into a Navy SEAL. Yeah. I'm just saying complete one thing. Yeah. So the third thing that you're going to do is I want you to go into the bathroom and I want you to look in the mirror and then I want you to say nothing and I want you to high five the human being you see in the mirror in the morning, every single morning after you brush your teeth. You do this every morning. Let's yes, take I a do. quick look. Right after I brush my teeth, look in the mirror. <sighs> really look in the mirror. And then... doing that. I love sending myself into the day with a high five. I got my own back. Let's go. Tell, Tell you the science. Tell us. So for your entire life, you guys, you have given other people a high five, right? Yeah. When you give somebody else a high five, what does it mean? You're doing great. At a girl. Yeah. Good yeah. job. At yeah. a girl. And what do you, and you've never gone, oh, I hate you. There you go. <laughs> no, no, ever. And so the programming is already in your basal ganglia. It's already a habit to associate this with, I love you, go get them. You got this. I, I see you. When you do it to yourself, something crazy happens. You aim wow. all of that lifetime of positive neurological programming right back at yourself. Something else you said, which I love, is a lot of people have their phone next to their bed. And we always yes. hear, don't put it, don't put it. But your reasoning behind why you don't put it, like why it, that isn't yeah, the why? first thing you see. Let me demonstrate. Okay. 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 Most of us either have it here, yeah. right? Or we have it like this, right? Yeah. yeah. So what happens is you wake up, it's your alarm. Yeah. You immediately do this. Right. So the first thing that you are putting into your brain, talk about not making space for yourself. Yeah. You have just let the entire world into your mind. You have let work stress you out. You have looked at social media and yeah. everybody else's life, and now you think you're behind in some fake oh. race. <laughs> and so <laughs> here's race. the thing. You can't trust yourself. I can't trust myself. Yeah. And so, so what do you do? You oh, leave it in the other I, room. It is literally in the bathroom. In the bathroom. And I leave the ringer on. We have a senior in college in Los Angeles. Of course. I you need have to, to know. Yeah. Right. Yes. If but something happens. You want to know Why? something crazy? What? The Today Show will text you all night long. Yeah. <laughs> but they'll only call you. If it's an emergency. If Correct. it's an emergency. Yeah. Correct. So you'll hear the call, but it's not there. So right. when you wake up tomorrow morning <laughs> yeah. and you literally go like this, <laughs> and then the alarm rings and you're kind of screwed over because now you got to get out of bed to turn the thing off. And you're going to be like, I hate that Mel Robbins person. But by the time you get to the bathroom, guess what? Yeah. 
You don't care to, to be You're obsessed. You're correct. You have a chance to turn it off yeah. and take the space for yourself. Yes, and you've already gotten up. There's no snooze. Yes. You yes. got up. Yes. yes. Okay. I hate it. I hate it. I hate this habit. But, but, but now you're in it. And now you're in it. Yeah. Okay. The other thing you said, which I think is brilliant, is to mm -hmm. stay close to people that want the best for you, which yes. is so true. It's like who you choose right. in your life helps elevate you and whatever mm -hmm. your dreams are. Yes. Now, here's what I want you to really think about. Mm. Do you want the best for you? And you need to make small changes in your life, like setting your day up for success, putting yourself to bed like you put your kids to bed or you were put mm -hmm. to bed. Remember the mm -hmm. evening routine? What does that do? It creates safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. It creates a sense of rhythm and routine. It makes you feel like you can have a sense of knowing and control in your life, even when things are crazy. And I think in life, you guys, we focus so much on the big problems and the big things out there that we forget that big changes come from focusing on getting just the little things right Literally. every single day. And so you can come back to your morning routine. Mm -hmm. You can come back to this idea of, of set your day up tonight. Yeah. So tonight, set your day up so for So what do tomorrow. you do? How, How do you do yeah. that? Oh, well, so first of all, don't take today's messes into tomorrow. Totally. Yeah. Just clear off the kitchen yep. counter, get the dishes in the sink so you don't wake up to a mess. I want you visually to have mm -hmm. a clean slate. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, make it easier. Mm -hmm. Make it easier. Set gifts around the house that remind you of who you're becoming. So, for example, the water. Mm -hmm. Put your filled water bottle at night next to your yeah. coffee maker. Mm -hmm. Yes. Lay out your exercise clothes yes. so that when you is get that up, your, is that your coffee yeah, machine? Right there, there? Yeah, right there. Yeah, right there. And then your you lay out your clothes. There so you can write it so right there. But lay out your clothes. That's good. You just I have do to that do yes. too. You want to know gym? why? You have to do yeah. it for your gym clothes because otherwise you're not going to go to the gym. Correct. And what do you do for your kids? You lay their That's clothes out so you don't have the fight in the morning. And here's the thing: Do I ever not feel like having a cup of coffee? Of course not. I don't go to my coffee maker and go, oh, it's raining outside. I'm really tired. I'm not going to have a coffee today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so one of the reasons why you put your water by the coffee maker is now you're doing what researchers call habit stacking. Yeah. It's visually there. You don't have to think about it. You're already right next to the thing you do without yeah. even yeah. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You just made it easier. And I love what you did. I think it was last week. You said you promised yourself that you were going to work out outside no yes. matter yes. what range. Oh, this Wait, and you went, get, yeah. We can't no let point. you go. This is a really <laughs> short tip, everybody. Okay. Do a 10-minute walk in the morning. You can walk your kids to the bus. You can walk around the block yeah. when you get to work. 10 minutes. New research shows that a 10-minute walk, walk like you're late. Outdoor That's and it. outdoors. Like outdoor. There's two reasons why. 10 minutes will add years to your life. It boosts your mood. You get a hit of dopamine. More importantly, when you get bright light first thing in the morning, right. even on a cloudy day, it sets your circadian rhythm which is going to help you sleep better at night. Okay, by the way, 10 she, minutes. She everybody. lives in Vermont. If she goes yes. outside in winter and you the freezing you went air, out freezing yes. cold. Then yes. we can do okay. it wherever we As I said I would, right? I had a great conversation yes. with Mel. That's why I want this one to continue. More inspiration. She's on my podcast, Making Space. We got new episodes every every week. Your podcast is incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. Mel, we could have done we, a whole Yes, show. I'll be back. Hour. Please okay, come back. Good. Wow, she is so awesome. How smart. And everything's simple. That's yeah. the thing. It's not like you need a lot. She just gives you the building blocks. Totally. And if, by the way, if she can get out in, that, in the yes. air in Vermont, yes. we can We all can. It. By the way, follow her on Insta. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Coming up next, Jenna and I take a break from the everyday chaos. We find some calm right in the heart of Manhattan after this.
Okay, if you haven't heard by now, this year Ahoda and I are we're <laughs> with a million drums. We're really into making space for ourselves and carving out the time to take care of our mind, our body, and our soul. So important. So we took a break from our busy lives, and then we headed to an oasis right here in the heart of Manhattan to take part in some time-tested healing rituals. Take a look. Hey, guys. We adore our jobs in the business, but it takes a lot of energy to have this much fun every morning. Hey, hi. Boom, throw it, hold up. And with five kids between us, the pace only picks up once we get home from work. So we were given an important assignment to make a little space for ourselves. Let's slow down. Slow. Where are we racing to? We're Nowhere. Not, we're not racing. We're gonna go slow. Anywhere. Wait, look, the well. It seems like the right place. Well, let's, let's go. go. This is the well in New York City, designed to be a one-stop shop for all things wellness. It's so important to create spaces where people can have time for themselves, you know, offer a wide range of, of options and tools where people can help navigate all the different things that they're juggling in their day-to-day -day lives. They also take a holistic approach to health. We're looking at all aspects of someone's health, the physical, the mental, the spiritual, the emotional. We're not just taking a symptom and looking for a drug that fits that symptom. Today, our prescription was to be bathed in a symphony of sounds. And our mind coach, Manjeet Devgan, she uses her voice and her instruments to send healing energy to the body. I grew up singing on stage in the temple, so I had a very spiritual upbringing. So I'm gonna take them through a little bit of sound bath so that they can feel how relaxing the instruments are on them, send them a little bit of energy healing, fill them with light. I'm so excited that you're here. Welcome to the well. Oh, we feel your vibe. I want to invite you to lie down. And are you okay with me touching your heart yeah. and your yes, shoulders and touch your head? Wherever. Okay. Yeah, blankets just to be cozy. You girls look so cute in your pink. We match. And let's begin. The sound of Manjeet's singing. <laughs> Combined with the vibrations of the drums and the singing bowls, put us in a completely calm state and left our bodies tingling. Last time, take a deep breath in and then exhale all the way out. Oh my God, that was really good. I mean, that was awesome. Awesome. I loved it. I don't want it to be over. This is the first time I've done a shoot like this or anything yeah. similar to this where you forgot. I forgot. Oh, that's good. That never happens. Our next stop, a manifesting hypnosis. You get to mentally rehearse what it's like to have already completed 2023 with the three things that you want to bring in. So I'm gonna guide you through this. Okay. Wow. Which Manjeet says will open up our subconscious. Imagine that next natural exhale flowing from the top of your head like a beautiful waterfall down the length of your body. And help change our old habits into what she calls new programming. And then on a TV screen, I want you to envision the first goal, the first wish that you want to complete at the end of December 2023, knowing that the brain waves are slowing down and allowing you to have mental rehearsal of everything that you're experiencing. Wow. You know, it's weird. I felt like I was in like a trancey state, and then you said you're going to be refreshed or whatever, and I feel totally too. refreshed. That's yeah. very strange. <laughs> so it's great that you're in the trancey state. That's what we want. So where are we seeing ourselves at the end of 2023? So this is sort of hard to even explain, but it was something about the way I want my house to feel, mm -hmm. the way I want my like the energy. Uh, that I have towards those that I love. I actually had a vision of like my family from like 30,000 feet, but it was evolving. Mm. Like that's what I was seeing. And I was like, I didn't know I was thinking about that or manifesting or even thinking about that. 
just remember what we felt like before we walked in the door. Mm. How do you feel right now? Like light. Yes. Airy. Airy. Did we just say that in unison and we're matching? <laughs> Cheers. Remember how calm and rested we, we felt after that, that? And we need Manjeet. She's our, our coach. <laughs> so we asked her to come here. Yes. Okay. So get comfortable. Get ready to tap into your inner zen. Let's all meditate together mm -hmm. right after this. Okay, as you saw before the break, we really felt rested and restored after our trip to the well. And it wanted us, it left us wanting more. We always want a little bit more. <laughs> so we asked meditation teacher Manjeet Devgan to help bring that experience to you. So she stopped by our studio and she showed us how easy it is to make space for a moment of Zen in every single day. Take a look. You're incredible. We want to start there. And I think if, if people, for people watching, they're like, that seems cool, but I'm not going to be able to get somewhere to yeah. do something. Is there any way that we can replicate any of these things ourselves? Well, one of the things that you can do is mm -hmm. actually purchase a sound bowl, a Tibetan sound bowl, yeah. and just use that. It's like very simple. You can buy it online because you guys felt the vibrations on your body. Yeah. Um, that's one thing you can do. And what, what would you do with that? So how would so you, yeah. You can actually strike it and just close your eyes and just listen to all the reverberations that come off and let your body feel it. You can place it on your child. I can, <laughs> no, I can actually I, feel it right this yeah. second. We just want to stop the show and do a sound <laughs> So you can do it for yourself. You don't need somebody you else to yourself, practice it. But also don't forget that your body is actually the most incredible healing instrument that you have. Uh -huh. And so when you sing, your vagus nerve, which is the wandering nerve yeah. that goes yeah. through your body, yeah. what happens is you tone that, you release nitric oxide, and then you're not only practicing your true authentic expression, mm -hmm. but also that release of nitric oxide when you're humming Mm. as well. It allows you to decrease inflammation and mm -hmm. stress in the body. It's like the physicality of things. I think sometimes we forget about the physicality of our body and how yes. it can actually translate into calming us. Yes. I mean, our body is incredible. And this is why I'm so passionate about the work that I do. And, you know, me and Rebecca Parekh, the CEO of The Well, we're Indian women and we love that this is our lineage. Yeah. That we're bringing people back home to themselves. Mm. So, you know, at The Well, we introduce all of these ancient technologies and modalities in the classes, in one-on-one -on -one sessions, mm -hmm. because it's about preventative medicine. It's about, you know, having that agency over your health. 80% mm -hmm. of the clients that I see are not breathing properly. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've forgotten how to breathe deep. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten how to sense our intuition yeah. in our body and trust ourselves. Yeah. yeah, so even learning to breathe properly is a great place to start. Yes. Let's talk about the hypnosis. Yeah. It was yes. something we had never really done. It yeah. was kind of like visualization yeah. in some ways. How, how can people experience that at mm -hmm. home? Mm -hmm. So to experience it at home, there's a number of apps. I actually have an app as mm -hmm. well, which mm -hmm. is 
hypnosis, some breath work, it's called Manjeet. You can actually close your eyes and just visualize how you want to feel in the future. And you can actually associate the emotions to do with that, mm -hmm. right? So, so what happened when we were in, mm -hmm. in that, when you're in that beautiful trance state, what's happening is you're slowing your brain waves down. You're opening up the subconscious mind mm -hmm. and then your body takes an internal snapshot of what that's like. And because the subconscious mind is open, it's like you've had that mental rehearsal. And so you can visualize and with the feeling, marrying it together. And you're designing how you want to feel. Your thoughts really create your reality. I think that's interesting because at the first of the year, you always talk about your goals and dreams and aspirations. But the idea that you will imagine in your mind what it feels like when it's completed. Yes. yes. It's like, and you can actually see and feel the feelings mm -hmm. that you get in your body are legit. Yes. Like you yes. really do feel and it. And it was sort of hard to, it wasn't like, you know, the typical New Year's resolution. Yeah. Like, I will have done this. Lose it was weight, like this blah, blah. ambiguous, beautiful yeah. visualization that yeah. was almost yeah. hard to describe. Yeah. Yeah. How, when pe you say people are breathing wrong, because that's if I were watching, I'd be like, well, how do you breathe yeah. right? I, I was breathing wrong, but you say it's like a low or belly you really yes. have to and how do you how do you feel to make sure you're doing it right yes so you place your hands on your lower belly yeah. relax the shoulders yeah. Yeah. yeah and you want to imagine that you're filling up a beautiful golden balloon but you're starting from the base of the spine so as you breathe in through the nose you're filling up from the belly upwards it's like opening a drawer and closing it so your belly should be sticking out yes. when you breathe as you in breathe in you got it, Jenna. Yes. You're breathing in the and the belly balloon. gets big. <laughs> and as you exhale, the navel retracts to the spine. So you, br so you push your belly out, yes. kind of. Okay. The biggest thing that we've been doing is chest breathing, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Down. And so yeah. which that puts our bodies in fight or flight mode. Yeah. But when you connect, and this is what I'm talking about, connecting to the belly, pranayama, ancient techniques, just being able to online the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, it signals to your body that you're okay, that you're calm, that oh, everything's gonna be okay. Yeah, we yeah. feel we that feel way. Manjit, you're the best. When you walked in, we <laughs> yeah. felt that. We thank did. you so, so much. Thank you, Manjit. Thank you. Uh -huh. We love Manjit. Oh, Manjit. Don't you, she just oh. makes you feel calm. She is the very Center. best. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back right after this. going to do it for us on this Monday. We hope we've inspired you a little bit. Maybe you'll make some space for yourself a little bit every day. We hope you will. And tomorrow we're going to go feed your soul with food. Some of our favorite chefs and yours will be serving up comfort dishes and easy weeknight meals for your appetite. And we will see you on Tuesday. Ah. See ya.
but this then, is crazy. Yeah. This yeah. is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom and they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce. Um, and an apple, you know, they're very that different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallholds, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, cremini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions, like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house, and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms, called pins, start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis, and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block. About 90% of it is sawdust. 
Small holds mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is a large like, third-party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas, and so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom-built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. We have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, but we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you uh, take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. Do you roast the whole thing? And you just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off Pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. It, when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Because um, you can pull it like. So yeah, it's almost you can stringy. Pull it. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this, and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. These are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber, they have amazing antioxidants, they have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now.
Small hold got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms, and I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school, and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world, and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? you Like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for uh, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So they are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna, you wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. I don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one. This is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second. We're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in the exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lion's mane mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your house do that. and do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy-free soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Sesame oil. Love it. You love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get, some, get a good, like, salt in there, right. and then you're just gonna whiskey do, dude. So this is gonna get, I think we have this on medium heat. Okay. Okay, we have some grapeseed oil here. The reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point. We're using cast iron. You don't have to use cast iron. You can use whatever you have. Um, so yeah. we're going um, score side down. down. So what's gonna happen, we're yeah. gonna put them on, we're gonna get a good sear on each side, and then we're gonna brush our glaze on. Okay. Okay, two minutes, flip it, two minutes, then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have said. Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop <laughs> it down. What we can do here, this is like a little, like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would do. For I'm sorry, do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to, yep. want to encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, I and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Look Wait. It, look at it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush <laughs> this on, almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh. 
Come on, baby. Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God, you, but except you could do this, but you see I the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. <laughs> Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me too. Uh -huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes, he doesn't need to okay. not Nothing trying to, crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's mane steaks. It's meaty. Can we dog. show them? <laughs> like they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like it almost it's almost like like you wouldn't really know. It kind of it just looks like mm -hmm. chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. It's mm. so good. Wait, this is, mm. this is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good. I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner to mushrooms, a mm. really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, mm. in this format. Mm. Try cooking them this way. Yeah and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Cause like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's mane steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want for meat, 
than all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's we'll start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein, Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium. We call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root, and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom root. I'm gonna you eat it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't want to say nothing, because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know. Is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast, really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand, and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient list, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted.
In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? Right, right. When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce. Super porous, yeah. Soak up anything that you give it. So, best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh, yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready All to right, flip. ready? Yeah. <sighs> I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges, Right. Did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking it's out food. right now. Get into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, just I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my God. I just touched it for the first time. Too. It's like the, the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see. I feel like it has that. But how? That's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. Okay, I'm gonna taste it. Should I taste it? This is gonna be your first time, I'm, like yes. stressed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can drop? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken, literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. You need another mic to drop? I need another mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm leaving. <laughs> I see my book. Yep. This is for my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute, I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> it is a pretty big sandwich. Mmm. I'm taking this home. This... Wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians, like something weird is going on here. Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true meat fashion, we need to take a selfie. Yes. So, if you don't mind, yeah. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special. No, truly. thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. That's a beautiful piece of chicken. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen.
comfort food. From a decadent cheeseburger, to a sky-high layer cake, or my favorite, my mom's spicy warming doll. Usually these indulgent eats aren't exactly vegan friendly. Even many traditional doll recipes are often prepared with ghee. But these days you can easily ditch the dairy and you won't even miss the meat with new plant-based takes on traditional comfort foods being served at restaurants all across the country. In Portland, I'm meeting a chef making crunchy fried chicken without the bird. And in New York, I'm sampling a Big Apple staple, cheesecake. But this one happens to be raw and vegan. But first up, I'm heading to Los Angeles, my hometown, to visit a popular fast food chain serving up show-stopping burgers without the beef. Growing up in SoCal, there was nothing more comforting than grabbing a burger by the beach and cruising down the Pacific Coast Highway. Monty's Good Burger in LA is recreating that iconic experience for a plant-based generation. Everything here, from a melty cheeseburger to fully loaded fries and even their creamy milkshakes is totally vegan. Lexi Jarris is the co-founder of the Up and Coming chain. What inspired you to start this place? I and my partners, it, it was a time in the vegan space in LA where there wasn't just a really good casual vegan burger. I felt like in order to get that like fix for a burger, I had to go somewhere with like white tablecloths and like you had to be waited on. In 2018, Lexi founded Monty's with Bill Fold and Nick Adler. Lexi and Bill both work in the music industry. He's a festival producer, and Lexi is a creative consultant for Coachella. Nick brought the culinary chops as a former food director for music festivals. I think because we all come from music, when it came time to like market and brand and like strategize how to grow, we were all coming at it from such like a non-traditional viewpoint. The Monty's team runs their business differently from many restaurants. They focus on creating digital buzz with celebrity milkshake collabs, pop-ups at festivals, and lots of merch. While Monty's now has five locations and millions of burgers sold, they make more money from their swag, like hats, t-shirts, and mugs, than the food. The star of said merch and the brand's namesake is Lexi's adorable schnoodle mix. How did Monty become the mascot? He's lucky. He's a lucky pup. He's very lucky. He was found essentially on the streets of Riverside, which is kind of nuts. We looked for his owners. They were nowhere to be found. So after a few weeks, I was like, this is my, this is my son now. But it really kind of, again, kind of goes to show like the playfulness and like the headspace we were in when we started Monty's. do work a lot with animal rescues now, and that is kind of something that's like in our ethos. We care a lot about animals, obviously, um, but not just <laughs> eating less of them, but also giving some like fluffy guys and then around the LA area homes. Monty's is dedicated to getting pets adopted, from dogs to cats and even guinea pigs. But their main mission is to change how people see vegan food. I think what's really interesting is that there is this stigma and this stereotype that vegan food has to be super healthy, right? When I first became vegan, a lot of my friends that aren't vegan would have dinner with me and they would leave and be like, I'm still hungry. I hate when Lexi picks the restaurant. I think if you come here, I highly doubt that someone will leave here. I mean, still being hungry. It's, it's lots of tots, lots of shake, lots of burger. To me, I feel that anytime someone is eating a plant-based meal instead of a meal that has like dairy, meat, whatever, that's just kind of a win for like the animals, the planet, their health, all that good stuff. I love that. Tell me about the future of Monty's. Where do you want to take this? Yes, I mean, honestly, like the sky's the limit. Like I don't want to say too big, but we're all definitely thinking like as big as America wants us to be. Amazing. I'm so hungry now. <laughs> I want everything. I will order every single day.
Monty's Good Burger is reimagining fast food for a new era. Co-founder Lexi Jarris introduced me to Gemma Kessler, the chain's operation manager. Gemma trains new chefs on how to cook the entire menu, which includes a plant-based chicken sandwich and fully loaded fries. And she's teaching me how to make the restaurant's signature item. Okay, Gemma, you are gonna show me how to make the Monty's Good Burger. Let's do it, let's I think go. You're ready. Making a Monty's Burger isn't all that different from prepping a beef patty. First up, Gemma oils the grill so the impossible patties don't stick. And then we're gonna smash those patties down. So I am going to use both spatulas and really get that squeezing out the edges there, as you can see. Nice. Number one. Number two. Perfect. Awesome. And now we're gonna have those just crisp up and cook on one side. And then we're gonna flip them. Flip it. Check Gorgeous. that out. Good thing I didn't screw that up on camera. <laughs> right. Next up, two slices of vegan cheese. And now I'm gonna have you spray a little bit of water on the outside there, creating some steam. All right. Perfect. Nice, that's gonna get all melty and melty, delicious. Melty, cheesy, we delicious. Love it. Next, we're going to raise this and add some grilled onions. My favorite. <laughs> this is like your entire store of grilled Amazing. onions. All right, perfect. Perfect, perfect. All right, and that's that it. Ready to go. To finish the burger, we get the perfect toast on our buns. See you later. <laughs> Time for the Monty's house bread. It's similar to a Thousand Island sauce. And what burger is complete without a pickle? Three juicy house-made pickles. Now the patty meets the bun. To your bottom this bun. This is the best part of my day. Okay. <laughs> this is going straight on here. There you go. I feel like I'm hired. I don't want to be forward, but okay. I think you might be. <laughs> this is the final step though. This is the important part. Okay. To build it all together. All right. Yeah, but you're going to fold that forward. Gorgeous. <laughs> okay, I am so excited to eat this. I want to try everything else on your menu. Should we go find Lexi? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, I'm ready? So Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Okay. I can't. It's just goes to remember. It's better. This is so insane. Because it has your touch. Lexi, what does it mean to you to have this amazing and plant-based contribution to California burger culture? This is our Culver City location. So this is definitely our most family-friendly location. We have customers that like come in strollers with their parents, obviously, <laughs> and they get like pins and stickers and things like that. But like these kids are gonna grow up with us around the corner from us. I think that's so just, like brings me a lot of joy. Especially growing up in California, and this was such a big part of my culture. Like getting a burger whenever, going to the beach, and yeah. I feel like I can have that experience again in a plant-based way. So thank you and cheers. It means the world. Thank you so much. <laughs> have to take a picture, please, because this just feels right. We love photos around here. This juicy burger had me craving more comfort food. So I'm off to Portland, where one vegan chef with a unique story is putting his own twist on Southern soul food.
Portland, Oregon is one of the best cities for plant-based living. From vegan donuts in every flavor imaginable, to the world's first all-vegan barbecue joint, there is no shortage of delicious veggie-forward fare here. One of my favorite spots is Dirty Lettuce, a vegan soul food eatery helmed by a chef breaking barriers. This is Super very tasty. visually impressive. Like, this literally is taking me back to like a KFC bucket. Yes. Alke Bulan Morosky is the chef and founder of Dirty Lettuce. How do you feel like you're making vegan food more accessible, more equitable, something that is digestible, no pun intended, yeah. <laughs> to a wider audience? I feel like a lot of the vegan industry for a long time has had this very, very heavy focus on like making it as healthy and holistic as possible. And that is very important, but it's like there's a reason why McDonald's is like the colossal juggernaut it is, because sometimes people just want to be able to eat something greasy and delicious and feel good in their stomach. <laughs> Alcabalon's soul food recipes are rooted in the Southern cooking traditions from their hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. You grew up in Mississippi. Pescatarian, so eating a lot of veggies, no meat. Can you talk to me about what that was like, especially in the South, a very meat-heavy culture? Yeah, it was, it was one of the things that made me want to do this, was I spent my whole childhood in the South, like, surrounded by lots of fascinating cuisine, like gumbos, etouffees, and whatnot. I remember always wanting to be able to try and enjoy these different foods and never really having the opportunity to, and until I decided to just do it myself. For instance, it means, like, cookouts are a really, really big thing in the South, and if you don't eat a lot of animal products, then you generally can't really go and engage with them to the same extent everyone else can. Growing up in the South was challenging in different ways for Al Kabulon, who is biracial and identifies as gender neutral. Did you feel like you had a sense of belonging growing up? I definitely don't really describe myself as a very masculine, per masculine person, but being a person that most people ID as just like a black man when they see me meant that there was a lot of intense pressure to like put on a performance of masculinity that just wasn't me at all. And I wonder, was that a reason why you started cooking? Was it a way for you to find a sense of belonging in any way? I did really enjoy when I first started messing around with these recipes in the South was being able to go to people who I'd known for years and were very, very against just like general vegan cooking or like, I need my meat. <laughs> and being able to come up with something and feed it to them and have them actually enjoy it and be able to go like, okay, this didn't come from a dead animal, but I'm actually enjoying my meal. Alcabalon's mother, who is also a vegetarian, taught them how to cook. And there were always tons and tons of cookbooks all over my household. They loved working with seitan and started developing a line of plant-based meats after college. But in 2019, a new law was proposed in Mississippi that changed Alcabalon's career path. I'd already been devising recipes to move somewhere else for quite a while, and then the Mississippi legislature decided they were going to introduce a bill that would actually ban the labeling of any plant-based product as any kind of meat. While the law ultimately was halted in court, it was a signal for Al Cabalon to pack their bags and head west. Why did you choose Portland? So I actually had a marvelous opportunity here. So I started off in Portland in a vegan food pod. So it was like supposed to be the first vegan food pod to appear in the US. That pod was Shady Pines Food Court, the country's first all vegan food cart park that opened in early 2020. While Shady Pines shuttered a year later, it helped introduce Alcabalon's food to the city's vibrant culinary community. I was definitely very well received and I got to be part of the publicity of like a vegan food pod, all vegan. One year after launching their cart, Alcabalon was able to open a brick and mortar spot in 2021. Here, the chef experiments with new seitan meat swaps for southern staples like pork ribs and catfish. I think in a lot of restaurants, if you go and order three different things made of seitan, you're going to get roughly the same seitan prepared in different ways. But I actually make a point to have like a completely different protein blend for each different fake meat that I do. Speaking of all this food, I'm starving. I'm not gonna lie, I caught a glimpse of that fried chicken and I think I might need it. Ooh, well, how about if we get back to this kitchen? I'm ready, <laughs> let's do it. All right. <laughs> make your iconic fried chicken out of seitan. Can you tell me about what seitan is and how you make this delicious chicken? 
Oh yeah, so seitan is, essentially it is pure, it is a mass of pure wheat gluten protein. Actually you would make it by just like taking regular wheat flour and washing it and till you have like a sticky protein left over. But these days you can just buy like the dehydrated gluten on its own, which is what we have here, mixed with a whole bunch of different spices. Alkabalon adds a liquid mixture to the wheat gluten. This is the secret behind the different meat textures. Yeah, and the idea that depending on how much like oil, fat, and water you have in your wet blend, you're gonna end up with a different final product of your seitan. The next step is similar to making bread. The seitan and liquid mixture are kneaded together. Like it doesn't feel like dough. Yeah. You know, it feels like it's something like, that has a lot more texture and, and pull to it. Yeah, the weird pseudo dough. <laughs> it's very much a pseudo dough. The dough transforms into seitan after simmering in veggie stock. After the seitan cools, it's cut into fillets and soaked overnight. Then the seitan is ready to be breaded and fried. Here is a chicken. A major thing for me with all my seitans is I try to deliberately make them as irregular as possible. Because mm. if you get like an actual piece of meat from an animal, it's not going to be it's a uniform perfect. disc. Right, yeah. right. The process starts with a healthy sprinkle of cayenne. Then, just like a regular dredge, it's covered in flour and a secret spice mix. The egg-free wet mixture is where things really get interesting. Oh yeah, so this is just a blend of mustard, water, a little bit of cornstarch, and my house spice blend. I love that. Mustard, why mustard? You'll see it sometimes in like old southern fried chicken recipes, yeah, but it's yeah. not nearly as common as you'll see, just like your standard egg or buttermilk wash. It's not as much a flavor thing as like a texture thing. Mustard is kind of acidic in a way that reacts with your breading. So yeah, going from there, we get right over into our second dry bath. Oh. And from oh. here, we get pretty weird with it. This is where we're actually building that texture of the chicken by hand. How do you do that? You just kind of... Yeah, so we start by just sort of coating chicken, coating our breading on there, getting a nice pasty, goopy mix. So yeah, that's how it's like, that looks like very rough and all over the place, but that's roughly what a piece of chicken is gonna look like before we fry it. Wow. It's like very rough, very lumpy. Yeah, wanna check that out? Oh, how cool. <laughs> Do you trust me to make one? Absolutely. Okay. Are you ready for my contribution? Yes. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we get these into some oil. Okay, oh yes, let's do it. The seitan chicken fries in canola oil until it's golden brown. Oh, I yeah. loved my fried chicken and then I went plant-based and I never had fried chicken, so this oh, is yeah. That's my goal. It's like let people have all the tasty things yeah. they eat growing up and not yeah. feel guilty about it. Yeah. Right, They're probably just about ready to pull this up. That is looking pretty happy. That's definitely like the go-to signature is just getting those proper flakes. Wait, do you hear this? You got that? I think you eat with all of your senses, right? Okay, mm -hmm. cheers. Cheers. All right, <laughs> going for it. Stop. <laughs> like, I know you know this is good, but... That's usually the response I go for. <laughs> it's well, so good. <laughs> the, like, oh my God, I can't even speak. The breading is insane. It literally tastes like chicken. I, the, one of the things I realized as I started messing with more and more vegan meats is that a lot of what people associate with a lot of traditional meats that they've eaten is not actually the protein itself, but just the way it's prepared. Right. Cheers, this is delicious. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for joining. But as delicious as Al Cable on Seitan is, their bigger goal is making vegan food more approachable. How do you think that you're making vegan food more equitable? A lot of people, it's like vegan food in general, I think is still a bit overpriced in most markets. Well, honestly, a big thing for me is I try to make sure that if I offer any product on my menu and make sure I can provide people with like a big hefty portion size and not charge them $35 for one meal. <laughs> Up next, a Brooklyn sweet shop that's ditching the dairy and creamy cheesecake.
Sweet, a vegan dessert shop in Brooklyn, specializes in raw desserts. That means nothing on the menu is heated above 104 degrees, so you won't find any ovens in here. Opened in 2019, Simply Sweet makes treats that are free from gluten and refined sugar. You'll find anything here to satisfy a sweet tooth, from chocolate bars to creamy cakes and fruity acai bowls. Because I love sweets, everything sweet. I love desserts and caramel and fruits, everything sweet. <laughs> Alessia Mirpochayeva is the owner and head pastry chef. She moved to the U.S. from Russia in 2012. After landing in New York, Alessia quickly got her start in the food industry at Juice Press, then a fast-growing smoothie and organic food chain with a celebrity following. I fell in love with their food and smoothies and juices. And when I got there, it was like a different world because um, I've never heard about some ingredients like maca powder, goji berries. I'm like, what? <laughs> Alessia also worked as a line cook at a private school in Manhattan. That's where she truly fell in love with cooking, whipping up delicious baked goods for the students. When Alessia became a mother a few years ago, she decided to start an eatery of her own. Can you tell me about why you started Simply Sweet? When I was pregnant, I was thinking how I'm gonna feed my baby when he's born. And when he uh, was growing up, and then he started to uh, pick food from my plate. I thought <laughs> I'm gonna give him a piece of broccoli, but when I look into my plate, I see like slice of pizza, <laughs> you know, with sausage, pepperoni, lots of cheese. I'm like, I gotta feed my kid this. <laughs> yeah, and then I realized um, I have to start um, from myself to change myself, change my everyday eating habits, so I can be an example for my son. Her first step, lots and lots of research. I'm not a professional chef, so I'm self-taught. And um, I go to Google every time <laughs> when I have a question. I took some courses about chocolate, how to make chocolate at home, how to make raw vegan desserts, and vegan desserts not only raw. Yeah, I use Instagram a lot because I follow bloggers, and recipe creators. I always uh, try stuff at home. I love to feed my family and hear their feedback, good feedback. After three years of running Simply Sweet, being a mom is still Alessia's top priority. And uh, I have a son, he's almost six years old and he likes my dessert. He's a big fan of chocolate. He likes chocolate truffles, chocolate cake. <laughs> so I try to keep him healthy. You must be the most popular mom in town. Like, do you bake everyone's cake? Uh, or no bake? I keep saying bake, but really there's no baking involved. I don't know. I would say yeah, maybe I'm pretty famous here. <laughs> I had to learn the secrets behind Alessia's unique treats. So she taught me how to make her favorite item on the menu, lemon blueberry cheesecake. It's super easy and literally everybody can make it at home. You're not dealing with an oven. You're sticking no. it in the freezer, you're letting it set. Yeah, it's a lot. It. Yeah, it's like low maintenance as well. Yeah. First, the hazelnuts go in then shredded coconut, and my favorite sugar alternative, dates. I love dates, it's like a part of my life <laughs> and brand. Yeah. The mixture is blended in a food processor for two to three minutes. So what should the texture be like, you know, when we know it's done? Yeah, uh, it usually changes the color. Okay. And it's like a little darker. Wet. Yeah. The pie crust is then firmly pressed into a mold. The sticky dates help bind the raw ingredients while the base freezes for about 15 minutes. The crust is in our freezer. Yeah. What are we going to do next? Uh, so now we are going to make our cheese part. First in, soaked and drained raw cashews. Soaking the cashews makes them easier to blend and ensures a creamy, smooth consistency. Our house-made coconut milk. I love that you make your own coconut milk. So how do you make it? Uh, we just mix coconut butter and filtered water. Coconut butter. Nothing Ooh. else. I <laughs> love that, very minimal. Next up, maple syrup, vanilla extract, lemon juice, and melted coconut oil. Okay, so you've yeah. melted and cooled that? Yeah. Okay. It's already melted and we use coconut oil so it stay firm. Mm -hmm. And when you um, take the cake out of freezer, it doesn't fall apart. The mixture is blended until it's totally smooth with no lumps. Can you believe this creamy filling is completely vegan? Okay, it's perfect. So now we're gonna put it in the freezer for like an hour. Okay. And then we're gonna uh, do our blueberry layer. Amazing. Yeah. See you later.
To the remaining cashew mixture, we add frozen blueberries and then blend again. With the fruit, the mix transforms into a stunning purple. Love Look it. How beautiful. Very I love this creamy. gorgeous color. It's so pretty. Wait, we have to show them this color. Sure. Check this out, everyone. Look at that. The first layer freezes for an hour before adding the blueberry flavored cream. Alessia was prepared with a fully frozen, half finished cheesecake for me to polish off. Gorgeous. And then to the freezer it goes? Yeah, to the freezer for about five hours. Okay. Then, and then it will be ready. And it'll be worth it. Those yeah. five hours will be worth it. <laughs> All right. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait five hours. So this is how it looks like. Yay, it's so pretty. And we're gonna unmold it. Okay. After unmolding, the cheesecake gets a final decoration. Shavings of Alessia's house-made chocolate. So how long would you wait for it to thaw before you start slicing it to serve? Uh, we will leave it at room temperature on the table for okay. about 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. And then we can cut it. Well, luckily, you're very prepared. You have slices yeah. for us. So can we taste? Yeah, sure, of course. So excited. Here we go. Look how pretty they are. Yeah. <gasps> this spoon is really fun. Wow. It's so delicious. You know, cake is such a comfort food for so many people, and a lot of people don't think they can have this healthier, delicious, decadent options. What are your favorite customer reactions from people who maybe haven't tried this before? Most of them don't realize um, our dessert doesn't have eggs and flour, and they're like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> they can't believe it. This is so fun to make it, and I will be eating this and taking it with me. So okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. With innovative techniques and lots of imagination, modern chefs are turning classic meals and treats into plant-based comfort foods everyone can enjoy. I'm a compost queen. I have become one with the compost. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Waste. From your rotten produce to your leftover takeout containers, there's a lot of it in the food system these days. A recent study found that the average U.S. household trashes about 30% of its food. That mind-blowing $240 billion a year, literally going in the garbage. I know waste seems like a huge problem to tackle when you're just one person, and corporations need to do their part. But a few small changes can make an impact. So today, I'm all about that low to no waste lifestyle. I'll be cooking with an expert in the sustainable food space, social star Max Lamana. Then I'm headed to a restaurant that composts all of its food waste. But first, my fridge needs a little love. So I'm headed to a low waste grocery store and it looks like I've got some packing to do. I'm about to head out to go to Precycle, which is a zero waste grocery store in Brooklyn. The thing about a zero waste grocery store is that there's no packages, so I've got to come prepared. And luckily, I love being prepared. So, I'm gonna start packing up. Precycle was started by Katerina Bogatereva in 2018. Her goal? Eliminate wasteful plastic from food packaging. In 2019, over 140 million tons of single-use plastics were thrown out globally. While bulk bins for dried goods have existed at health food stores for many years, Katerina had a different vision. A one-stop shop with everything from flour to produce and even cleaning supplies. All without single-use packaging. Why did you decide to start Recycle? Well, actually, it started with my own personal struggles to, to live a, a lower waste um, mm -hmm. lifestyle. Uh, when my son was five years old, he was in a kindergarten and he had a sustainability lesson. So one day he came home and he said, Mommy, do you know how long the plastic will remain in a landfill? And at that moment, it sort of like made me realize that 
we have a responsibility towards um, next future generations. So I took a very close look at my own trash at home and um, I realized that a lot of the waste that I create actually comes from food shopping, whether it's a packaging or food waste itself. So we can <laughs> thank your son for this establishment? In a way, yes. You know, it feels like a really big challenge, right, for people to overhaul all of their life choices. It's possible to shop uh, with creating less waste in, in any store. It's just kind of seeing seeing the right products. For example, I don't know, instead of canned beans, we, one can buy dry beans in a bulk store using a fabric bag, or just shopping in the perimeter of the store for um, unpackaged produce, or going to farmer's market. And I think a lot of people get really excited when they go to a grocery store and they want to get everything, right? Exactly, yeah. I think shopping for one or two meals or a couple of days in advance is the key because one tends to buy a lot and then with every day that that product sits in your fridge is less likely you're going to use it um, and that creates a lot of waste. Katerina, not to brag or anything, but I came very prepared. So tell me how I get started. Okay, it's very easy. So we're gonna just weigh your, your containers okay. um, so that we know what to deduct when we check you out. All right? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Here I go. go. And the weight is 0.97. We're gonna write it with this um, washable marker. Oh, that's edgy. There we go. Perfect, and then you're gonna deduct this from whatever I'm putting in here. Exactly. I mean, it's so easy. Forgot containers? Don't worry. The store has a selection of glass jars and reusable bags. So Sama, what are you making today? Honestly, what am I not making today, Katarina? <laughs> but actually, I came here specifically to make a pasta. Oh, wonderful. I have a really nice selection for you. Come go. this way. So this variety is amazing. Where do you source all of these amazing ingredients from? So about 95% of all the products in the store are sourced locally and about 80 hyper-locally. So wow. um, this pasta is from New Jersey and this is uh, made in, in upstate New York. Wow. I also loaded up on my favorite kitchen staples like moong dal, cashews, and of course, a ton of dates. This is the only appropriate size to get some medjool dates, okay? Precycle even has extra virgin olive oil and honey on tap. Even the tofu here comes without wrapping. It feels very overwhelming on where to start. Do you have a couple easy, actionable tips for somebody looking to reduce their waste? Some of the simple ones are reusable water bottle, your own coffee cup if you go to a coffee shop, or just simply bringing a bag. Or if you want to challenge yourself, and maybe that's the next step, you can also look into just what waste you're creating and pick an item that you can replace or, or source differently that works for you. Um, I think it's a very individual journey. It's, it's the, it, there's no recipe that yeah. fits all. Single-use plastics are nearly impossible to avoid at most grocery stores. But shopping at Precycle gave me a new perspective on what's possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it's nice to meet you. Nice and thank you for having me in. It also had me wondering, how can I waste less in the kitchen? Up next, I've got a virtual cooking lesson with Max Lamana, a vegan chef known for his tasty and sustainable recipes.
back at my apartment, I couldn't wait to get cooking. To help upgrade my low-waste game, I called on London-based chef Max Lamana. Max is a vegan social star who focuses on sustainable cooking, and I am here for it. Max, it's so good to see you and chat with you. We are online Instagram friends, but not real life, and this is as close as we're gonna get right now since you're in London. Uh, hopefully when we meet in real life in IRL, we'll, we could be friends as well. We can be friends and we can cook in person, but for now we're cooking online. Can you talk to me about your background and also what you sort of specialize in when it comes to food? Yeah, I'm a low waste chef. Uh, I started cooking maybe about 15 years ago. Uh, my first job was in a pizza restaurant and I've kind of just worked every single position in a restaurant. So yeah, a few years ago I started seeing the, the, the problem that we, we're all currently living with because at the end of the day, it's not just food that we're wasting, it's money, it's time, it's energy, it's water, it's transportation, it's packaging. There's so much that goes into the production of food that just throwing away food doesn't make any sense. In 2019, Americans threw away over 133 billion pounds of food. The major culprits are typically fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and uh, potatoes and bread. So. A lot is being thrown away, um, but we as consumers can make small changes every day to waste less food. On Instagram, Max teaches his one million followers easy, low-waste food tips. One in particular went pretty viral. Yes, you really can eat an entire strawberry, stems, leaves, and all. Okay, I'm really excited to get cooking with you, so can you tell me what we are making today? Are you ready? We are making cauliflower alfredo. That's it. Simple. Easy. But Delicious. there is a little no waste secret because we're going to use the entire thing, right? The entire thing. Nothing's going to waste, Sama. Everything. Yes. The core, the leaves, even this guy right here, the florets. Everything. First up, prepping our cauliflower. I just have a saucepan of water behind me and that's on a low boil right now. It doesn't get much simpler than this. You don't need to prep or cut or do anything. You just literally take the entire cauliflower, submerge it in the water for about five minutes until it gets fork tender. Um, but I am gonna put some salt in there. You with me, Sama? I'm with you, but I'm just gonna chop it up super roughly before I add it into my steaming basket. You know, you can also save your leaves and if you, were, if you wanted to, you can roast them in, in the oven and they would be nice and crunchy and crispy, a little soft and tender on the inside. Without further ado, Sama, I'm, You're gonna I'm pop ready it to in? give this cauliflower okay. a bath. The cauliflower steams for about five minutes, just until fork tender. Now, on to the garlic. What you can do with garlic peelings. Um, you can actually eat the whole entire garlic peeling as well, um, but we're not gonna, we won't do that here today. You're not gonna demo um, that for me? I'm upset. I won't, I won't, I won't <laughs> demo that for you. I'm not, I'm not gonna eat it. No, I'm not. So, two things you can do. You can dehydrate the skin uh, once it gets nice and dried. Uh, you can blend it into a powdery uh, consistency, and that can be uh, basically a powder that can go into any kind of like soups, stews, or stir fries. The other thing I like to do is that I actually keep my peelings. Yeah, I keep my peelings and we'll make a veg stock afterwards. Max sauteed his garlic in olive oil for a subtle sweetness, but I'm leaving mine raw for a spicier kick. So I love this recipe because it, the sauce is super easy. So you're literally just adding all the ingredients into a blender. I'm just gonna cut right down the cauliflower. My cauliflower is finally done. Ta-da! Okay, so we're both adding our cauliflower, uh, florets, stems, leaves, all of the above. I will add my garlic and pasta water. Okay, so I'm gonna add my garlic in, and then I'm also going to add a little bit of my reserve pasta water, just a touch. And this will just help it blend, and also it's a nice way to not waste our pasta water. It gets everything really nicely nice and velvety. You are using silken tofu for this recipe, right? And I'm gonna right. use hummus. So this is kind of a nice alternative. If you don't do soy, you can try it with hummus. If you do like soy, you can try it with tofu. So we've got options for everyone. And what do you options. think the tofu adds to your Alfredo, Max? 
Uh, tofu is adding protein, but it's also adding another layer of creaminess as well. Maybe a lighter creaminess than the hummus, but still creamy. Do you have lemon in yours? We have lemon. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna grab my lemon. Yep. And I wanna ask you what you do with lemon peel. The, the peel itself has so much flavor in it. If I'm gonna use the juice, I use the zest first and then use the juice. The other thing I like to do as well, if I'm not gonna use my lemons in time, I blend the whole entire lemon. Really? With some water and then I pour them into ice cube trays, freeze it, and next day I have frozen lemon cubes. And then I can add some, you know, sparkling water. That's really nice, I'm gonna try that. Half the lemon gets zested right into the blender. The rest is saved for later. We've got a lot of our elements in here, but now we're gonna go in with some nutritional yeast, right? A little bit of yes. cheesiness, a savory flavor. All right, what yeast. are you adding next? I'm gonna add some vegan Parmesan. Nice. So this is cool because yeah. we've got the nutritional yeast for that cheesy flavor. You're using some vegan parm. And then the cauliflower, the tofu, the hummus, they all add these really nice, yeah, yeah, like mm, creamy mm, elements, mm, right? Mm. That's, this is, this is my preparation dance for once it's all coming together. It's like, mm, mm, mm. I had some leftover veggie stock, so I poured that in for a little extra flavor. Mm, mm, I'm practicing. <laughs> Enough dancing, time to get blending again. I just hit the switch. Oh. The two creamy sauces are complete. I'm ready for the pasta. Do you also have some fettuccine? I do. I'm using fettuccine pasta. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna probably add a little bit of the sauce into the pan to start, just to get it cool. nicely coated with the pasta, and then I'll go ahead and add the pasta in there, and then I'll go ahead and add some of the rest of the sauce. There and are some other things you can do with the sauce because there's quite a bit of it, right? Totally. So what you could end up doing with the sauce is use it for soups, use it for stews, use it for even a dip. I mean, I think having a little bit of like a, a chip in there that's it's really good. Quite, quite nice. Okay, so I'm gonna add my pasta into my little pan and the rest of my sauce. It's so creamy. It's like luscious. Love a saucy pasta, so I love recipes that yield a lot of sauce because I'm like, let's go, you know? A gentle toss in the sauce ensures every piece of pasta is well coated. I'm, our, I'm, I'm ready to plate up, Sama. I'm ready to plate up too, Max. Okay, so I'm gonna save this pasta sauce for tomorrow, but you could also freeze it too, so that's another option. Time to give this pasta a no-waste taste. So we've got our pepper, we've got our lemon zest, we've got our salt. What do you want to garnish with? The lemon zest? Off on the side, just on top, some lemon zest. Beautiful. I'm happy with the result. How's it looking it on your delicious. end? It's delicious. You know what I think we both have in common is that our phones eat before us. Shall we grab a little Our photo? do eat before us. Okay, ready? <laughs> I'm ready to eat. You ready to eat? I'm ready, yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. This is so unexpected and so good. So creamy. Mmm. That's what I was just gonna say, is that this is very, very creamy. So what are some yeah. tips that you have, some other tips for people who are looking to reduce their waste in the kitchen and while they're cooking? I think the most practical and easy thing is to cook the food you already have before going out and buying more food, then shopping and creating a list with that shopping list. And stick to that list, don't go off the list, buying other different bits and bobs, like stick to that list. Um, but before you go there, I think, Find recipes that work with your schedule. Donating food is a great option, but also my favorite, compost. Composting food shows that food is going back into the earth, back into the soil to give rich nutrients to the soil, giving rich, uh, rich nutrients to the plants that grow our food. Max, this was so much fun. And thank you for doing your work and educating and inspiring people to cook and eat no waste and low waste. It's incredible. That's delicious. This recipe is gonna be on repeat for me.
Composting is a crucial part of a low-waste lifestyle. At Papil Gustative in Santa Monica, the owners are committed to composting 100% of leftover food. They operate their own kitchen-to-compost facility where scraps are turned into nutrient-rich mulch. Let me show you around uh, how our low-waste establishment. Let's do it! Papil Gustative translates to taste buds in Latin. It's run by Kalen Senchak and his wife Marina. They use simple but effective methods to cut down on waste. So starting with the to-go, everything is compostable. Starting from the lids, uh, the trays, of course the napkins, and all the cutlery is made out of wood or out of compostable uh, material, paper straws, even our uh, trash bags, if you see, is a special trash bags that are compostable as well. Even the restaurant's napkins are hand-sewn from recycled jean scraps. And to avoid plastic in the kitchen, chefs use only glass bowls and containers. And what happens, Kaylin, to maybe the fruit or vegetables that aren't perfect when you receive them? We make jams, we make pastries, and for that we actually look for, for fruits and, and vegetables that might be aesthetically blemished, right, but they are perfect. And we, we hate to see the farmers uh, have to throw those away. You have a really huge compost mission with this restaurant. Can you show me how that's kind of done back here as well? Yes, this is our own compost, which is coffee, food, greens, eggshells, avocado peels, everything else. Eggshells even? Yes, that's of amazing. course, eggshells. Eggs, eggs and coffee actually are one of the best things that you can feed the, the soil for plants, yes? Because of the calcium, because of all the other nutrients. So that's, that makes your garden beautiful. I am so excited and ready to try your food, Kaylin. Should we get into it? Absolutely, let's try everything. Let's do it. Marina and Kaylin are both passionate about building sustainable habits, which led them to the food industry. What was your inspiration behind starting this restaurant? First, we actually were inspired just to open a coffee shop. Uh, coffees and tea, single origin, uh, like really good quality. But then eventually people were asking us about more. They wanted food, they wanted breakfast, they wanted lunch, and we expanded gradually. But Kaylin and Marina are just as focused on what happens after the tables are cleared. You own the composting process from start to finish, even the facility. Can you tell me about that process from start to finish? We have this uh, little property in, in downtown where we have another company and we are thinking, why don't we use that, right? So we, we did a little research and then it, it became clear that's very easy to compost if you really put your, your heart into it. So all you have to do is dig some ho holes, aerate them properly, and just mix all your, your, your compost there. And then eventually you can use it from growing crops. What do you think the restaurant industry can learn from your low waste model? Well, they will learn that's actually very easy to do. You only have to commit, you only have to put a system in place, and it's gonna make a great impact at the end of the day. You have kids, and this mission is really important to saving our Earth, right? Absolutely, we're doing it for uh, the future generation, we do it for our kids, we do it for everybody. For their kids and their kids, and yes. for all the generations, yeah. The food here speaks for itself. They even have vegan croissants. Yes. This makes me so happy. I like can never have croissants. It's very important for me to take a photo of everything because otherwise I'll forget and this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. After lunch, my leftover scraps went straight into the compost bin. No food waste.
In Santa Monica, California, Papil Gustative is on a mission to stop food waste. I helped load up the truck that will take their kitchen scraps to the restaurant's very own composting facility. Kevin Conaway is Papil's expert composter. Compost for that, so. Cool. The composting site is located about an hour from the restaurant. Here, they've transformed an empty lot into an urban garden. What are we doing today? What you need to know about composting is that there's not much to know. <laughs> okay. It's pretty much just layering it up. Once we put everything in, what happens in the process? Microorganisms are going to eat the food. They're going to break it down, and pretty much it'll just disappear. It'll all just it'll all just be wet, and we keep it wet, just just a little bit of water. Okay. If it gets too dry, that it slows everything down. It's best to compost in a shady area, so Kevin dug up large pits by trees. But you can also compost in any kind of container, from a storage bin to a trash can. All right, Kevin, I'm ready to compost. This is everything we're composting today, right? Yep. First, we made a layer of green materials, which is basically anything left over from the kitchen or garden. Think veggie scraps, coffee grinds, eggshells, and plant trimmings. Dump it out, yeah, make a mess. And then I can toss the bag in too, right? That's right. Then we added carbon-rich brown materials. This can include shredded paper, cardboard, twigs, and dried leaves. And what do those layers do? What is the cardboard, the sticks? Why are we adding that to the compost process? Because if you have all or all scraps and no cardboard or no carbon on top of it, it just turns into a mushy, gooey mess. Then, just continue alternating with green and brown layers until the waste is all used up. Okay. Woo! I'm a compost queen. I have become one with the compost. Meat, dairy, and oils should only be broken down by industrial composting facilities. They can attract unwanted pests like rats and flies in a home garden. Meat can also contain harmful bacteria like salmonella, which can spread throughout a garden's edible plants. How long does it take for our compost to break down, Kevin? Generally, anywhere six months to a year. If you keep it moist, it, it'll be pretty much ready to go in six, nine months. Finished compost is a nutrient-rich mulch. It's a deep brown that basically looks just like dirt. So what have you been growing then with the soil that you kind of can create through the composting Just process? Just vegetables mostly. Okay. What yeah, kinds of vegetables? Well, yeah. Anything. Peppers, tomatoes, anything that Colleen thinks he needs for his uh, menu, then we'll plant it. This compost garden is still a work in progress, but by next spring, it will produce enough food for regular restaurant use. Kevin, it's really interesting because Vernon is such an industrial area, right? And you're literally creating a compost facility right in its backyard. You don't need a plot of land to compost. You can literally compost in an apartment, be on a smaller scale. This kind of material in a landfill, it doesn't really break down and do any good. So instead of throwing them in the landfill and just going to waste, we can recycle those nutrients, put it back into the soil. Kevin, thank you so much for teaching me how to compost. It was shockingly way easier than I expected, and I will be back to reclaim my duties as your apprentice composter. <laughs> thank you. Managing food waste is a massive undertaking, and many changes can only be made through legislation. The EPA found that less than 10% of U.S. households had access to curbside compost collection in 2017. That's a lot of food we could be saving from landfills if we just had compost bins next to recycling and trash. Some big changes are already in the works. Major cities like Los Angeles and New York are expanding city-run composting. And those advances are due in large part to individuals petitioning for better policies. Sometimes it takes local changes to kickstart a global impact. I mean, I was almost going to wear a yellow dress. That would have been a lot of turmeric. Aww, that would have been cute. Set. We would have really, like, <laughs> we would have been, like, real turmeric champions. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, 
restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Turmeric, or Haldi in Hindi or Urdu, is prized for its golden yellow hue and the warm, earthy aroma it imparts to a variety of recipes. It has a rich history in South Asian cuisine and culture, and it's always been a fixture in my own home. Recently, many in the wellness community have also touted turmeric's potential health benefits, often labeling it as a superfood. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about one of my favorite spices. Are there any proven medicinal uses? Whether it's in root form, ground, or dried, how do you keep it fresh? I can't wait to share a comforting dish with turmeric that always transports me back to my mom's kitchen. But first, I want to get to the root of it all, literally. So I'm off to a farm growing turmeric in a surprising place, upstate New York. Growing up, turmeric added beautiful color and wonderful flavor to almost all of the dishes my mom cooked, from her masala veggies to her haldi rice. But she only used it in its dry ground form. I wanted to see just how my family's favorite spice is farmed, and I didn't have to fly all the way to India. Am I giving me a little tour? Yeah, that's right, you, yeah. It. About two hours north of New York City is Green Owl Farms in Rhinebeck. Suzanne Kelly converted her home to a working farm in 2013. Here, she grows potatoes, squash, and saffron. But her main crops are aromatics, namely garlic, ginger, and of course, turmeric. The turmeric plant kind of grows like a hand, then it will grow even more fingers right. off of that. Suzanne's love for agriculture began after college when she started growing vegetables. From graduate school in Florida to teaching at SUNY New Paltz, she never stopped gardening. What was your journey to getting to this point? I was an academic for a little over 10 years, yep, teaching women's gender and sexuality studies. And I was sort of longing to do something else. I had a big rambling garden and I was thinking a lot about agriculture at that time. Yeah. I just sort of decided to take the leap. Suzanne's home sits on less than an acre, but after some extensive research, she realized she had enough land to turn it into a farm. How did you learn so much about all of this? It's mostly self-taught. Yeah. Just really following what, you know, what the experts have been doing, learning from other farmers. Oh yeah, I never worked on a farm. Suzanne picked garlic, ginger, and turmeric as her main crops for strategic reasons. They can be grown without extra hands and don't need much space to yield enough to sell at farmer's markets. They can also easily be dried or ground up for sale during the winter. So give us a little explainer on turmeric. So turmeric is a rhizome that is traditionally used in uh, Southeast Asian, Middle Eastern, Indian cuisine. It's used as a spice. More people are probably familiar with it in its powder form that um, gets all ground up and dehydrated and then put in a jar and then we buy it in the spice rack of our supermarket. Turmeric is native to South Asia, specifically India, known for its warm tropical climate. So how do you grow turmeric in New York? I've been inspired by lots of other small farms that have been doing this in the Northeast for some time over the last, I don't know exactly when they started, but certainly over the last decade. I get my seed from um, from Hawaii. In Asia, there are more than 100 varieties of turmeric. Suzanne grows Indira yellow and Hawaiian red, which fare better in cooler places. You need at least 10 months to be able to grow it to full maturity, at which point it's how you find it in the grocery store, sort of with that hard, um, tough skin on the outside. Suzanne starts growing the delicate seeds in her climate-controlled basement in late February. I visited the farm in early summer to help Suzanne move the baby turmeric outdoors. This is a, about a hundred and I think 120 feet of um, a turmeric bed that we're going to plant. I'm ready. Okay. I've never been more ready. Turmeric, a rhizome, is closely related to ginger. Both have thick green stalks that grow upward above ground. The thick nodes and roots lie in the soil. The nodes, called rhizomes, are what we eat. So we're just going to Loosen the soil like that, and then stick it in like that. And that's it. Wow. We're gonna do a plant them about four to six inches apart. All right, so, so I'm gonna, gonna loosen, loosen it up a bit. Okay. A little deeper. Okay. All right, so going straight in? Yep, straight in. Great. Have fun in there. You did it. Did you see that? Did you see that? Okay. Excellent. Good job. 
Good job. So did you, am I you hired? really good. You are. I'm you hired. Are. You're okay. hired. Yep. I'm hired. Yep. Yep. Job, yep. Sorry. Now you just need to do 200 more of them. Okay. Okay, maybe <laughs> cancel that. <laughs> May not have a new job. By mid-October, the young turmeric is ready for harvest. So we pick it young. You're sort of hustling to get it harvest right. <laughs> before the frost comes because by November, by mid-November, you know, you might have snow, it's yeah. possible. With a short growing period before winter sets in, Suzanne picks the roots before the plant reaches full maturity. It has a kind of like fresh, young, kind of yellow, and in some cases red, depending upon the type, type of turmeric, kind of hue to it. Um, and the texture is a little bit different too. It's not as fibrous. It's more sort of like an apple when it's picked young. At the farmer's market where Suzanne sells her produce, she also hands out recipe cards to customers who may be unfamiliar with fresh turmeric. Suzanne, tell me a little bit about your customers' reactions when they see the turmeric. Well, the first reaction is, what is this? <laughs> yes, and then if they know what turmeric is, uh, they'll be like, oh yeah, I take that in a pill form. Right? Like these, a wellness these, angle. Like a wellness angle, yes, that really is about throwing it in your smoothie. Yeah, yeah and I think it's it's important to like educate, right, on that, on where it comes from. Yeah. It's so interesting because I, I really have grown up around turmeric for as long as I can remember. Obviously very important in Indian cuisine and medicine and all of that, but I've never planted it. So it's so cool. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to literally put oh, it into the soil. That's it's just, great. It's amazing to have that connection, right, between something that you eat and something that actually grows yeah. from the ground. In India, turmeric's importance runs much deeper than its culinary use. It's a huge part of many traditions and daily life. To learn more about its cultural legacy, I met up with Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya, an MD who also practices Ayurvedic medicine. Her book on Ayurveda details the history and methods used in the ancient holistic practice. What is Ayurveda? It is the longevity, which is Ayush or Ayu. So longevity and how to live well, and Veda, which is the science or the knowingness. The medicine of Ayurveda is that part of not just staying well and being healthy, but also the other side, which is when you're sick, when you're diseased, how to get well. Ayurveda is based on ancient writings that promote whole body wellness through diet, physical activity, and mindful practices. So those of us who practice Ayurvedic medicine focus more on the food is medicine, lifestyle medicine, and medicinal herbs, medicinal oils. But when you say, what is Ayurveda? Ayurveda is just a philosophy. It's not a religion, but it's a philosophy like organic living. We shared a meal at Divya's kitchen in New York City. Divya chefs apply Ayurvedic principles to all of their recipes, and turmeric is used in many of their dishes. This looks so delicious. We've got a Kichdi classic, we've got a cashew curry, and we've got a mung bean soup. In the traditional practice, turmeric is considered anti-inflammatory. It's used to treat a variety of issues, including digestive problems, PMS symptoms, and arthritis pain. And so the golden sense of turmeric goes all the way from being an antimicrobial that protects the body to an anti-inflammatory, and this idea that it really enriches the body. 
Another use that is not a spice in cooking is what we now today call turmeric latte, which is <laughs> taking <laughs> milk and putting a teaspoon of turmeric in it yeah. and using that as an anti-inflammatory before bed. Many Ayurvedic health claims are not supported by Western medical experts, but scientists at places like UCLA and John Hopkins are conducting more research. What is sort of that importance of turmeric in Indian culture? Um, it's part of the sacredness of honoring our bodies, yeah. honoring our minds, and it's something that comes from the ground and protects us. There's a lot of cultural aspects of this. So there's Gaye Holud, which is where the bride and groom will have their own family members before marriage cover their whole bodies in turmeric and give them a bath in that. And there's variations of it in different cultures, but having that bath cleanses them, gets them ready. When we were kids, if we ever had a boo-boo, one of the prized things we could show our friends is that mom put some haldi on our boo-boo, right? Instead of a band-aid, you'd go and show that there was this big yellow stained spot. And so the golden sense of turmeric, it really enriches the body. In Ayurveda, turmeric's healing elements make it an essential spice for the whole body and even the mind. But I wanted to learn more about the latest medical research on its purported health benefits. Family in India uses turmeric in almost every dish for many reasons, in part because they see the spice as a preservative and antiseptic. But recently in the US, turmeric is being hyped as a health supplement. You can find it in pills, powders, and even beauty products. But what does the science really say about its benefits? To learn more about its many uses, I met with spice expert and cookbook author Kanchan Koya, who also happens to have a PhD in biomedicine from Harvard. I'm so excited to talk about all things turmeric with you, but I want to know a little bit more about you. I'm a scientist by training. My lab started to study the health benefits of turmeric in cancer. I had grown up in India where turmeric is just a part and parcel of the everyday and because I had grown up with it, I had kind of rolled my eyes at all the obsessions around it. And then here I was doing my PhD, my lab is studying turmeric and it was a real aha moment for me that a lot of this ancient kind of ancestral wisdom around these spices is bearing fruit when it comes to modern research and I was like, okay, maybe there's something to it. Conscience Lab studied the yellow pigment found in turmeric, curcumin. So curcumin is one of the compounds in turmeric that has been best studied 
and it's a polyphenol, which is just a certain kind of chemical compound that has effects in our bodies. Conscience Research found that curcumin aided in chemotherapy, making it more effective in treating cancerous cells in breast cancer patients. The reason I hesitate to sort of think of curcumin as a cure-all is because we don't have that many randomized clinical trials looking at the effects of curcumin in a whole human. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't have benefits in a whole human, it just means we need more data. Different brands of ground turmeric have vastly different levels of curcumin, but the actual amount of the polyphenol isn't required on food packaging or supplement labels, so it's impossible to know how much you're actually getting. While ground turmeric is readily available in most grocery stores today, the whole root has been growing in popularity as home cooks and wellness devotees learn more about the spice. When I was younger, I never cooked with it fresh, so I was excited to try it in a new way. We're going to be talking all about turmeric, and you're going to show me how to make a fresh turmeric tea. Never used fresh turmeric until I tried this tea when I was traveling in Vietnam. Fresh turmeric root isn't widely used in traditional Indian cooking, but it's a staple in Southeast Asian cuisine. So we're starting with fresh turmeric root, and this basically looks like ginger, but once you cut it down the middle, you will see it is very different. I think it looks really pretty, thinly sliced, so I'm just going to make some thin slices and rings. Are there any benefits to using fresh overground? So, you know, it's not a simple, um, this is better than that. I would say in a perfect world, you should incorporate both. Turmeric powder is rich in vitamin C and B6, plus it contains magnesium and iron. From a culinary perspective, they're very unique. The fresh um, has this sort of more vibrant, zesty kind of vibe, whereas the dry is definitely earthier, a little bit more bitter, and really amenable to adding to things like curries, soups, vegetables, whereas this is really nice in teas, broths, soups, and smoothies. Okay, so what are we adding in next? Okay, so next up we're going in with ginger. So next up is lemongrass, which I think just adds a really beautiful flavor and almost like a grassy note. Are we boiling this to the max? I like to boil the water, turn it off, and then add the turmeric and let it steep. And that's because I'm trying to preserve some of those essential oils that are really, really rich in the fresh turmeric. The turmeric tea needs about five minutes to steep. Our tea is hanging out, it's steeping, it's having a good time. I have so many questions for you about all things turmeric. So let's talk through all of these different varieties. There's actually so many. So here we have the Roma turmeric, which you can see is really, really vibrant orange. It's the one we used in our tea. Next, the yellow and mango varieties of turmeric both have a lighter color and a more delicate flavor. This is crazy, I've never seen this before. And it's a slightly different turmeric varietal. There's a lot of chefs, especially here in New York, that absolutely love blue turmeric because of this pine menthol flavor. Does it add color though? So I think um, it's very subtle, the color. Yeah. It's not as much, obviously, as the other ones. Whole dried turmeric root can be grated into dishes. It adds a unique brightness compared to the powdered spice. What are your tips for buying turmeric from the store? So my first tip is to buy it from a reputable spice brand and not from an open spice market. I love open spice markets, but we do have some disturbing evidence now that sometimes turmeric can be laced with heavy metals, specifically lead chromate to make it look more vibrant. Buy it where there is a clear package date and an expiration date so that you can at least know when it was packaged. So what about fresh turmeric? How do we store that? I would treat it just like you would ginger. So you would buy your fresh turmeric, put it in your fridge, maybe for like a week to 10 days. And if you want to store it longer, I would put it in the freezer. It's actually very easy to grate. A common cooking technique in Indian cuisine is blooming turmeric in hot oil and pairing it with black pepper. This helps bring out the flavor of both spices. So talk to me about the relationship between black pepper and curcumin. And is that a myth? Totally should be doing that. So curcumin, which is the main bioactive in turmeric, is obviously packed with benefits, but unfortunately isn't very well absorbed by the body. It's rapidly cleared by the liver. You really want to improve that bioavailability, as we call it, and you can do that by pairing it with black pepper. 
And that's because black pepper has a compound called piperin, which can reduce that clearance of the curcumin by the liver. In Western medicine, there have been few studies with limited participants conducted about the interaction between ground turmeric and black pepper. But Conchin says the research looks promising. I've learned so much, and now I'm very excited to drink some tea. Is it ready? It's ready. It's been steeping for a good five to eight minutes, Yay. so we're ready to pour. Let's drink it. So this is almost ready to drink, and the okay. reason I say almost is because of the pepper point that we just covered. So if you really want to bring out those health benefits, especially from the turmeric, just a little dash of black pepper is Ooh. all you need. And finally, we want to add a little drop of a healthy fat, and that's because Pepper will improve the bioavailability of the curcumin, but so will a fat source. And I'm just going in with a very tiny drizzle of olive oil. Ooh. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Okay. Isn't it lovely? It's so vibrant and like zesty. It's but vibrant. But also not overwhelming at all. Right. I love learning how to make this. So thank you. Say turmeric. Turmeric. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to use turmeric in one of my favorite ways, kichdi. Kichdi goes by many names in India, from kichari to kichari to kejari. Every region in the country has a unique version, but it's usually made with lentils, rice, and turmeric. And like any popular comfort food, every family has their own spin on the dish. My mom didn't really make a stew, but her combo of light and fluffy rice with lentils was always one of my favorite meals. Something that's really important to know when you're cooking lentils and rice is that it's really important to rinse and soak them before cooking. Rinsing helps get rid of any debris in the rice or the lentils, and then soaking them will allow it to cook faster. And now I'm just going to drain the water before I start cooking. I'm just going to add enough water to completely cover the rice and lentils so that we can cook it properly. This is roughly four to five cups of water, but I just want you to make sure that you're covering the rice and lentils completely. Now we're going to add turmeric, our star. We can't have kitchidi without it. It's going to add that nice golden color and it's delicious. So I'm going to cook the lentils and the rice until it's completely mushy. I want it to be really soft. The lentils cook for 30 to 35 minutes. While this is coming to a boil, I'm going to start prepping my veggies. The best part about kitchidi is that you can really sub in your favorite veggies. I'm using carrots, zucchini, and sweet potatoes, but green beans are also really nice here. You know, I really like to be a vegetable artiste. Uh, but you can cut your veggies however you want. My lentils and rice, they've come to a boil. I'm gonna move it to my back burner on a simmer, and then I'm gonna bring my steaming basket over here so I can start steaming my veggies. I let the veggies steam for about 10 minutes until fork tender. Time to chop up my aromatics. First, a rough dice for my onion. Then, just peel and grate fragrant ginger. My veggies are done, I'm gonna move them to my stove top and then get to work on sauteing my aromatics. Now that my pan is hot, I'm gonna go ahead and add my coconut oil. 
Once the oil starts to shimmer, I'm gonna go ahead and add my cumin seeds. I'm adding whole cumin seeds to the oil to allow the cumin seeds to bloom, extract that delicious flavor. But you know it's ready when the cumin seed starts to sizzle and bubble. You only want this to go for about 15 to 30 seconds. You don't want the oil to burn. And you're gonna go ahead and add your onions. That's the sound we like. We're cooking these onions on medium heat until they're tender and translucent about three to four minutes. And now I'm gonna go ahead and add my grated ginger. I'm gonna cook this for a couple minutes with the ginger. We're gonna add some salt and pepper. I gotta clean my workstation so we can assemble our kitcheny and take this off the heat. Check out the rice and lentils. <gasps> now is the time where everyone becomes friends White shirt, risky. <laughs> I'm gonna turn my stove on, cook the lentils and rice with the onions for about two to three minutes, and then I'll go ahead and add my veggies, cook everything together, and then we'll be done. I'm ready to serve myself a bowl of kishi. I've been waiting for this moment for a very long time. I finished my kitchity with some fresh cilantro and freshly ground black pepper. Take a quick picture, send it to my mom who I hope will be very proud of me. I think I got the shot. Now I get to eat. The best part, obviously. Oh, so good. Cheers. It's so good. It's very nostalgic for me too. What else can I say? It's cute, it's comforting, it's kitschy. That should go on a shirt. I have a bit of a kitcheny lunch date. I'm gonna be joined by nutritionist Sarika Shah, who's gonna to talk to me about all things turmeric and kitcheny. Get away. Sarika, it's so nice to meet you. I have been very excited about our kitcheny date. I just made some. Um, can you talk to me first about your family's kitcheny recipe? Because I know, you know, depending on where you're from in India, everyone makes it a little bit different. I use my mom's recipe. Um, it's a one-to-one -one dal and basmati rice ratio. But something slightly different my mom does is add um, spinach to it. Sarika Shah, AKA the Indian nutritionist on Instagram, is a registered dietitian. She's been practicing for more than 20 years. Her goal is to teach Indian Americans how to eat traditional dishes in a healthier way. She also happens to know a lot about turmeric. What are the nutritional benefits of turmeric that have maybe actually been backed up by science? Are there any? So um, science is still studying turmeric, but turmeric claims to treat skin disorders, upper respiratory infections, any ache and pain essentially. Um, and that comes from Ayurvedic medicine. So does science back it up? There's limited studies, subjects of 40 to about 120, but I have seen studies with a thousand, but that's really not enough to give me the science backing to say, yes, this is exactly what it proves and this is what it does. But the studies are positive, so I think there should be more studies done. So with that being said, do you include turmeric as an element of your recommendations for clients at all? Um, no. Turmeric as a capsule or curcumin, which is the compound out of turmeric that is also glorified. So I don't recommend that. I'm very cautious about that because FDA regulations are not stringent on supplements. Is it laced with lead? Is it have other products in it? So um, if you want to include turmeric, the only way I will ever tell people is included in your food in the powder form. So tell me about how you feel about Indian food and turmeric as well coming to the forefront of food and culture. Especially in the US, that Indian food is coming up to the forefront, that it's being appreciated as healthier food, um, as something good. And I think that's great for the generations growing up. When I grew up, I would never bring Indian food to lunch. I wouldn't be caught dead with that. Um, <laughs> because the smell or the color or people staring at me, but if it's now something that they claim as like a lentil soup, which is actually our dal with rice, no one's gonna bat eyelashes at it. I think it's when we glamorize it and we try to make large doses of it and make it something bigger than it really is, is where the risk comes in. But if we take it for as it is and the way we've used it for thousands of years in our culture, I think it's perfect and it's great. Turmeric is definitely the golden child of spices. Its warming aroma and Ayurvedic properties have been staples in India for centuries. 
As more research is conducted on its health benefits, there's no doubt that this spice's popularity will continue to rise. But turmeric's cultural significance should never be ignored. But this then, is crazy. Yeah. This yeah. is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom and they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce. Um, and an apple, you know, they're very that different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallhold, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, cremini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions, like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house, and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms, called pins, start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis, and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. 
City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block. About 90% of it is sawdust. Small holds mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is large, like third party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas. And so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. We have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, but we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. Uh, yeah, yeah. You uh, <laughs> take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. Do you roast the whole thing? And you just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off Pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. It, when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Because um, you can pull it like. So yeah, it's almost you can stringy. Pull it. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this, and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. These are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber. They have amazing antioxidants. They have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now.
Small Hold got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms. And I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? You, like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for a, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So. They are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. They don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one, this is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second, we're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your you house do and that. do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy-free soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Sesame oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get, some, get a good, like, salt in there right. and then you're just gonna whiskey do dude so this is gonna get I think we have this on medium heat okay okay we have some grapeseed oil here the reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point we're using cast iron you don't have to use cast iron you can use whatever you have um, so we're going um, score side down. down so what's gonna happen we're yeah. gonna put them on we're gonna get a good sear on each side and then we're gonna brush our glaze on okay okay two minutes flip it two minutes then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop <laughs> it down. What we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just like, flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would we do for I'm sorry, do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to, yep. want to encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, I and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Wait. Look it, look it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush this on, <laughs> almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh, 
Come on, baby. Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God, you, but except you could do this, but you see the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me, too. Uh -huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes. He doesn't need to okay. be not Nothing trying to crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's mane steaks. It's meaty. Can we walk. show them? <laughs> like, they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like, it almost, it's almost like, like you wouldn't really know. It kind of, it just looks like Mm -hmm. Chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First, some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. Mm. It's so good. Wait, this is, mm. this is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good. I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner, to mushrooms, mm -hmm. a really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, mm. in this format. Mm. Try cooking them this way, yeah. and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Cause like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's mane steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want for meat, 
and then all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's we'll start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein, Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium. We call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom root. I'm gonna you eat it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't want to say nothing, because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know. Is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast, really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand, and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient list, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted.
In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? Right, right? When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce, Super porous, yeah. soak up anything that you give it. So best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready. All right, to flip. ready? Yeah. <sighs> I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges. All right, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking out right now. Get into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my God, I just touched it for the first time. <laughs> it's like the the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see, I feel like it has that. But how? <laughs> That's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. Okay, I'm gonna taste it. Should I taste it? This will be your first time, like, yes. stressed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can draw? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken. Literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. You need another mic to drop? I need another mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm leaving. <laughs> I've seen my book. Yep. This is from my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute. I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> it is a pretty big sandwich. Mm. I'm taking this home. This, wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians. Like something weird is going on here. <laughs> Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true me fashion, we need to take a selfie. So yes. if you don't mind, yes. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special. No, truly. thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. That's a beautiful piece of chicken. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen.
comfort food. From a decadent cheeseburger to a sky-high layer cake, or my favorite, my mom's spicy.